Welcome to Biggest Geekest. We are your hosts. I'm Joe. And I'm Randy. This is episode 60 of our podcast, and the date is Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. And I heard a little, a little mote of noise in my ear from something or other. Might have been. Computer. I heard a dinging sound from my computer. Maybe that was it. They go, do, do. But I can't turn it down or I can't hear you. Weird. There's a way to there's a way to mute those. Um, it's like an email ding. Yeah. There, to to there's a way to, uh, to mute those, but you have uh, to get into your settings. Oh, not my settings. Yes. Your settings. All right. So um no gaming this past week, but we've got some gaming scheduled uh, coming up, right? Shooting a big, I'm going to go for a big day, yeah. Hopefully get the six hours plus. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys will maybe get a couple hours in before we get there. We might. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm thinking of a way to do something with them until you guys get there. So okay. I, want, I want this. We'll talk about it more. So during the mud play segment. I'll talk mud about play. It. Well, our contest... Um, our YouTube subscribers did reach a hundred. Yeah, baby. Um, so it seems like every time I go on the Friday night chill stream over at um, Legion of Myth, they uh, I get a few extra uh, subscribers for us. Probably because of your uh, good looks and charm. Well, obviously. obviously, if I just appeared on more people's podcasts or their um, well, podcasts wouldn't matter because you'd only hear me, but. Right. more youtube videos that might just do it you. yeah that's what i was thinking yeah I'm, i'll hopefully get on there this friday i want to chill with them this friday Got maybe I can, yeah maybe i um maybe i could do the max headroom thing and just um <laughs> pop in everywhere pop in everywhere <laughs> put my head in dude that's a reference to yesteryear yeah how many listeners probably a few more but more than a few of our listeners have heard of max headroom <laughs> i mean i i don't have the I don't have any, there is no, I don't know if there's even a way to do that. They're probably, probably if you're a hack, if you're a hack master. <laughs> well, um, the contest, uh, will be, we'll be doing the random determination that we have 18 people who have given us out their email. Um, it seems like as many times as I have poked at folks, um, people are resistant. It's only, yeah. 18 no, sides show my d18 from bcc yeah i'm ready to roll that crap yeah but so, you know people who are interested will um join people who are not will not that's what fine. was it was it was it max from uh legion of myths said that uh if we put something out he was interested in he'd put his name in there uh, he did he put his name in he said he'd oh, be a lot man. more he'd be a lot more interested if it, okay. we didn't have anything from wizards or paizo it sounds like i should probably put like some sweet uh planescape thing in there yeah, he really he really likes he Planescape. That. He would yeah, love yeah, that. Yeah. He'd love it. Make it all you should make all three items Planescape. That would just, definitely just for him. Just for Matt. Yeah. Actually, no way, because I love Planescape. I'm not giving that crap away. Right. It's right. my stuff. Right. Well, um, in other news, it looks like Paizo is uh, done again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Again, I mean, it's you know, kind of a constant thing, I guess. Continues um, to be. Phylactery apparently is a, a bad, naughty, evil word that shouldn't be in their game, so they're nixing it. Which, I mean, I don't really care because, yeah, don't I don't really care about Paizo. It's right. just kind of dumb, but hilarious at the same time. Yeah, I guess everything that references religion you can't use. I mean, how are you going to use priest anymore? Right. Can't I mean, say cleric. No, no, you cannot. Can you use the word God? That's or gods. Somebody's offended. I'm so. sure. I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm sure there's been like thousands of people. I think the, they claim phylactery. Wasn't they claiming it was anti-Semitic or something? Oh, it's just that it might offend people of the Jewish faith, perhaps. What about Gollum? A Gollum? Yeah, Gollum. Well, people Jewish have thing? brought that up, apparently. Oh, okay. As being oh, problematic. problematic. Okay. And Paizo, so you, you do you, but you're yeah, just... Yeah. You're picking nits where there's no need. Do what you want. Don't care, but it's funny and uh, worth a uh, mockery. A mockery. A mockery on you. Mm -hmm. A pot, not a pox, but yeah. 
a mockery, a mock, a mock Sabanya. <laughs> All right. Um, also, in Twitter land, there was a um, fellow who posted an, uh, a series of tweets about um, Looney Tunes characters uh, and others that got uh, their stats. They got statted up in old D&D terms. Yeah. And uh, so they're only partial pictures, so you couldn't see the whole right. write-up. So I went and found the uh, Dragon Magazine, which he had the wrong one listed. Oh. He said it was 41 and ended up being 48. Oh, that's okay. We'll forgive him. This time. This time. This time. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see if I can bring it up. I'll, we'll have a link to that in the sh in the uh, show notes. Yeah. But um, it was in the. Let's see if I can find out when. It's at the top of the. And I'm looking at now. Apparently, a follow up in '82. There they did the Tas, um, the Tasmanian Devil and Marvin the Martian and Donald yeah. Duck later on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this uh, ended up this uh, Dragon Magazine. For uh, 48 was in uh, 1982. So, oh, maybe uh, it was all there. Yeah, he got his dates off too then. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe um, some kind of reprint issue. Who knows? Some typos or whatever. Maybe awesome. I've got one that has a typo in it. I don't know. Should be. Anyway, I wish I had my old ones. I don't think I had any that old. Not really. Any, were the 60s. Right. Anyway, um, Bugs Bunny is a 15th level illusionist right on it dude. is chaotic good you know i don't know maybe just chaotic i would say yeah uh bugs leaned good now daffy was chaotic neutral which i thought was spot on yes yes well there were plenty of times he tried to kill off bugs bunny <laughs> only nuts <laughs> number of i love his number of attacks dude one to twenty one to twenty randomly. Yeah, doing but one point of damage. He, yeah, one point of damage. He's not very effective in combat, no. really. No, and they had Popeye. Popeye looked like he was probably, I'm sure he had 1,800 strength. Oh, only 18. Oh, it says 1863 or 25. Yeah. After he has his spinach, I guess. Yeah, it's after the spinach. His con right. goes up to 22, and his, intelli his intelligence <laughs> and wisdom, oh, all of his stats go up after he's had his spinach. Because spinach is good for you, dude. Yeah, yeah. They all, they all get really, he's really buffed out. That was, um, you know, it's funny. I used to really enjoy, when I, when I collected dragons, I enjoyed their April issues. They would do the April, they would do a lot of spoofy stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was an April issue, but. Oh, yeah, it is 81, but it is April 81. <laughs> sounds right. They were big on that. So um, I always enjoyed that about the old dragon and stuff. It got less fun as it went along, but. It was pretty good for as long as I collected them. I never collected the, I have a few of the electronic articles, Dragon Plus or whatever they call it online, but it's just lost all its um, charm. Without having the actual magazine, I'm sorry. It's just electronic magazines don't, I don't know. They don't cut the mustard. Right. Right. What I think what ended up happening that got screwy was he, he referenced issue 41 and issue 41 is from September of the previous year oh, okay so i just went forward a few issues to see if i could find the right one so maybe april of that year or april of the following year would be would have the others in it so yeah but if you're to check it out it's kind of cool if you got a little bit of old school nostalgia and a little goofiness they had some of the famous characters i know um the year did you ever get that dragon magazine cd rom yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I never be. did because I remember I used to have a boatload of those magazines and mm -hmm. um, I sold them off, which, God, I wish I'd not, but oh well, live and learn. Right. But Well, I have an electronic version, so I don't okay. have a paper version. Mm -hmm. All righty. Anything else before we, I mean, that was kind of a, oh no, we skipped, we skipped call-ins. Oh, yeah, we should really do that if we had some. We do. Not very yeah. many, but we have some. Okay. Have some. All right, cool. Let's see. 
I have to bring it up on the computer because right. I totally forgot. I usually have this ready, uh, but not today. Slacking, no, slacking. Yeah. Well, we had our first little snowstorm today. Were you out in that mess? I was out. Sweet. Yep. Well, it was kind of. Cool. It came down. It was kind of dramatic for maybe ten minutes, and then right. yeah, yeah, it all melted was, away. My, uh, we had cut the grass today too. After that was all, <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. But uh, yeah. All right. I'm sure, that'll be the last cut though. Don't want to have no more grass growage after this. I'm hoping to get it cut tomorrow. Not in the Michigan. Yeah, lucky, lucky kind of. If, if I get to um, uh, cut it tomorrow, it'll be luck. You know, because by this time, normally there's no way to cut your grass. Right. All right. All right. So we John have a Allen? few. Huh? They all from John Allen? All three. Yes. Okay. Cool. Hey there guys, it's John here from Red Dice Diaries, just listening to your How High episode. <laughs> nah, I'm just playing, that was my vape. Anyway, in <laughs> res regards to your question about have you played any games where you're like, maybe I don't want to play it at a high level, I would say yes, I certainly have. The main culprit for me has been like a Vampire the Masquerade, which... I don't play so much anymore, but I still enjoy play the latest version, which has a slightly different set of rules. I used to play loads of it like back in the day, and we played a lot of like quite high level games. And I've seen like when you first start out, the the idea of vampires is that like, you know like oh you you having to like balance this whole like curse of vampirism with like your new responsibilities and trying to fit your old life and stuff like that. It's supposed to be a game of personal horror, according to the blurb. I find that when you've got to a higher level, you've got that many disciplines, you know, like the vampiric powers and stuff like that, that the game becomes a, a bit more like a sort of superhero game, I suppose would be the best analogy. And I've heard a few people say that, like, oh, vampires just like superheroes who need blood to power their abilities. And at low level, I don't know whether I agree, but when you get to sort of higher levels, and obviously it's not a level-based system, but you know what I mean? When you get to like the high levels of power, you have so many of these abilities and you're so vastly beyond what a human in the system can do, that you really are more like a blood-powered superhero than a sort of suave aristocratic or violent mad creature of the night. So that unless they were dealt with sort of like in a in a certain way you know with a, a very skilled gm the the high level vampire games didn't really have a great deal of appeal for me anyway enjoying the episode i'm going to get back to it take care and i'll catch you soon um interesting john because i remember when i was teaching high school a long time ago had to have been almost gosh over 20 years ago i had a kid we we're talking gaming and i was a dnd -er, and he's like oh, i don't play dnd &D. he goes i like vampire because it's you know it's not as crazy as dnd &D people flying around and, you know practically being superheroes i'm like look i don't know much about vampire but if you're a vampire and you're fighting mortals you're pretty darn close to being a superhero and i think those high-powered vampires can do lots of crazy stuff oh they can so, yeah so i think that that comment uh so heroes that need super, superheroes that need blood to function is probably pretty accurate yeah especially if you i'm not sure which version this was in but i know that i read in one of the vampire books a while back that uh if you could somehow trace a, you know if you can kill and i think drink the blood of a, an older vampire mm -hmm. you get more powerful oh yeah so there's kind of a path to becoming uh I mean, truly frightening. I mean, just being the vampire normally. Right. And I think bad. that was a that was looked down upon in vampire society. You didn't do stuff like that. And then if you did, you tend I think there was a title, there was a there was a label you got for someone that killed other vampires and drank their blood and took their powers and it got them into some hot water with all the political stuff. So it's but possible, it could be but that it. would be something I probably would push to do. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Screw you. I'm gonna be the only vampire. Yeah. I mean, it's like the dude um in Blade. 
he wanted to be top vampire dog. Yeah, he did. And Where's don't blame him. I mean, right. He's already hey, better than all the humans, practically. So you're gonna be a blood sucker, be the best blood sucker. Yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> And yeah, I just realized that I've sent you the previous message and I've sent you a part one and part three. Don't worry about it. There's only two parts. Slipped on my finger as I was pressing the keys on my tiny mobile phone and accidentally hit the send button before I could correct it. And there you go. What are you going to do? Fat fingers versus a small phone. A small phone's always going to win. Hey, John, we wouldn't have called you out, bro. We saw the one and three. We just believed. <laughs> yes, we just went with it. We, did. we, do, right. we do that. I thought John was being like mathematically slick and cool. I was expecting the next next one to be five. There's some list the odd ones. I was going to be very impressed. <laughs> An odd sequential order. And the next one would be two in plus one for you math geeks out there. <clears throat> um, There aren't any. <laughs> you math lovers, lovers of much math. Hey, Taylor yeah. likes math. He took advanced calculus, dude. He Honestly. took advanced calculus. That doesn't mean he likes it. He loved it. That's why he majored in creative writing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. He did uh, his other his other degree was in computer science. So it's almost math. Might as well be math. Might as well be math on a computer. Everything might as well be math. It really should be, since it's the most important thing in the universe. Except I um I <laughs> I don't know where this came up at. Um I can't remember. But in the course of this conversation, this fellow said, uh, uh, numbers are not real. Okay. And I'm like, okay. So the figures we use to represent quantities, uh, those are made up, but they represent sure. something real. Yeah. Quantities names are, are real. Names are made up. Yeah. Joe is a name that it was made up for you. Yeah. And so it's still okay, whatever. That's like I think it was on Legion of Myth. You guys were chatting one time about philosophy, and you were just like really blasting it. And that's when you go down that rabbit hole. It's like, dude, I get it. We can think all weird and abstract like that, but who cares? I mean, come on, that's getting kind of silly. <laughs> all right. Well, um, that was a very short segment one for wow. us. Wow, okay, cool. Because we did that and that and that, and that's it. Because we'll do the contest at the end, right? We're going to do the contest at the end, and we will announce. So between now and the end of the, the podcast, you have to decide what the new stuff is. So, oh, no, pre so no pressure. No pressure? No pressure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For the third contest, man. All right. All right. So on to the main topic, yeah. which is the narrative or the dice. Essentially, uh, which is more important, the, uh, what the dice determines or what the story needs? Yep. Uh, I'm just going to say the story don't need nothing. <laughs> the story yeah. doesn't need. The story gets what it gets at the table. Oh, I see what you're saying. With the dice. Okay. Um, so, a little <laughs> perspective. Oh, short podcast. See you all short next podcast. time. We're done. We solved it. Go answer it for us. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, are the players heroes or are they just the main protagonists currently in a wider world, essentially? Right. right. So are they the heroes? Do we have to, at times, save their butts when they do something stupid or when they have a bad role? And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, and I'm not really trying to be a butthole about it, but like a player does something dumb or makes a bad role, say there's something smart, but he rolls stinky and falls off the cliff. I mean, how important are the characters? This goes to the narrative of the dice. Do you let, and because we don't, as, as hard as Joe is going after the dice, we don't let the dice decide everything at our table. No, no. You have it in our mud sword place. You had a character saved by a narrative experience. Yeah, but uh, there, was a, there was a motive behind that that wasn't merely you wanted to save the character. The motive was um, why have why bring in brand new characters when we're just really play testing so just keep the same okay. characters so had it been had it been a quote unquote um, quotations real campaign where we were playing the game for we are playing for fun but it's play right. testing a set of rules because you were 
my, I've decided basically that characters aren't dying in the play test because what's right. the point? I don't right. want you rolling up new characters unless you just want to play a new character, and that's fine too. People can have four or five characters. You know, our friend Patrick's talked about how you could wish to play the wizard, and I was like, play a wizard. You know, I ran that last scenario for two groups. The first group didn't quite make it all the way through, and you guys did. But that first group's design was two fighters, a cleric, and two halfling rogues. And then you guys had one of each class. Yeah, you had one of each class. That was it. Rogue. Yeah, because we had four. We had four, you know. And so I told Patrick, I was like, dude, if you really want to play a wizard, because we know he loves wizards, just play one. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the deal. Our premise is old school. So if we have a group of three player, four players, and two want to play wizards and two want to play rogues, you do that. And if you're planning on doing an adventure that sounds like there might be lots of fighting, you need to pony up some cash to get you some mercenaries. Or you should if you want to play it smart. Now, as you get higher level, you can do lots of stuff with that kind of combination. You guys can be ultra sneaky and invisible and crap like that. But uh, to get too far down that rabbit hole, the point is, so minus that, you would say in most campaigns that you play in, you'd prefer that dude's dead. That's it. Dice says he's dead. He's dead. Um, I'm not saying I prefer my characters to die. <laughs> However, um, yeah, um, I prefer to let the dice fall where they may because I really because do. it's so, because if you're, I think if you gear the um, the campaign to have to have those characters, then uh, you have to, sometimes you have to do some really crazy stuff to make sure the characters stay alive you have to retcon uh, what we did was actually in line with mm -hmm. what could be i think because sure. we did a service for a local temple and um the only thing that doesn't make sense is how long it probably would take to get the character down there yeah you likely would have died yeah there's no way you could have said he was you know on death's door the whole time you were unless you had a unless you had an um uh, an elven uh a maiden carrying him in a, on a horse the whole way well then he's yeah and saved him by conjuring water horses and running over the nazgul chasing you right but, right, I mean, right it was just okay yeah i like that scene but anyway um yeah that's a good point um and at some point since we've i've modified the death and dying rule some as per our discussion i um uh, Maybe I do want to let characters die just so we can see. You can see how happens. it affects um, the dynamics. And then you say they yeah. start at level one. Yeah, baby. Old school. Might as well. Know. You think see so? How it, see how it works. We could see how it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about this, though? There's a counter argument. So if the characters are, because everybody comes to the table to play, they want to be heroes or the big, the big man on campus big woman on campus um and they spend a lot of time thinking about their character investing in their character if they do and we can argue whether they spend time building it or not right or whatever right. game so maybe the question is do you think there's some games where it is important to be a little more narratively controlly and don't let players die on whims well this it's a table decision right yeah, so right. the the players and the dm and the players the dm has a bit more heft in the decision because he's the one making the campaign with right. some input from the players so if um, that dm has to have those players live i think that's i think i think it's a mistake but uh, yeah. i can understand continuity some people really like continuity so right. they'll retcon or whatever to make sure play uh, players live but i think it's uh I don't know. It's a game. So if you played a game from right, so if you played a game from levels one to fifteen, let's say, okay, or one to twenty, and through that campaign that you ran, and you have five players, that's all you have through the whole campaign, but you have 20, 29 characters play through the campaign because there's all this death, you know, legs got off and stuff, and by the end, the four or five PCs that started the campaign, none of them are there for the end. I guess that's not a huge deal. Um, Gandalf though, and Boromir yeah. both died. Yeah, so Gandalf yeah. came back changed, 
Boromir right. stayed dead. Yep. The uh, and the company of uh, the fellowship mm -hmm. broke, and they split and went different ways. Right, chunks of them. So, um, and then different people came in um, as like guest stars, you can say. So yeah, there, Faramir showed up, and yep. But but you still had, as far as Boromir, I would argue Boromir was a he was not a mook but he was a second tier in terms of the story oh sure sure i mean sure. i get that he was he was a great champion from gondor and all that stuff right, 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 right. but he was not he was not aragorn he was not saying he was none of the three little hobbits and he wasn't gandalf and even legolas and gimli, gimli they were not to me they were a little further away in terms of importance than those five well, certainly they got less screen time. They had their um, their um, uses. Uh, oh, Gant sure, they were good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but with the character continuity, I mean, mm -hmm. some tables, it's you are the heroes, you are the stars, right? And um, let's see how the stars get from level one to wherever they get to, and that's mm -hmm. how they play. That's fine. I prefer finding out if you become the heroes not sure. knowing so yeah. you're a relative nobody you don't have to be like a a, a poop farmer no <laughs> dong farmer yeah yeah dong farmer you don't have to uh you don't have to be that uh low on the totem pole but right. um zero First to hero yeah. and then hero and beyond I don't or second you third level there. you're kind of nobody yeah, well, been a lot of adventures went one to three. Mm -hmm. um, do you think? Um, so you don't think it would for you? It wouldn't take the steam out of the campaign if you I had the five care. If you start with five one care, if you start out playing a wizard, and by uh, the end you were you were a lawgiver, and that was your twentieth level character. Right. Um, I don't think so. It all depends on the other, the rest of the table too. So right. while I might have no problems and i would the, the situation we were talking about before where my uh, the wizard died mm -hmm. i'd already rolled up a new one yeah and yeah. um i i was playing on the new one the new guy being having um amnesia only remembering as long as he's been at that complex and not yeah, really and remembering had, anything beforehand and we had him captured yeah he, and yeah we, we did a classic you picked him up as a prisoner and uh, then we, you know, we decided your character was just unconscious and was in a coma. Because um, I really, truly, and even when we did that, it's not like I said, I can't recall. Actually, I think I may have said, I may have originally had death as the spiders. When I ran that spider against the other group, our buddy Larry, his was a save or die. He made it. Yours, I had not changed it, but I had thought in my mind, I don't think I wanted to be save or die for first level characters, second level characters but I never actually wrote down to change it. And I said, screw it. I'm going to give him a chance to just be in a coma. And uh, we kind of storied our way out of that. Games that do that, like 13th Age and Dungeon World, let you kind of, I don't know about, I can't speak to Dungeon World very well, but we can speak very well to 13th Age, mm -hmm. where you can narratively make changes. Um, definitely, and 13th Age is a double dose for that because your characters are already super buff as it is. And if you can also play your relationship points, the way it works is at the beginning of every session, players roll a number of six-sided dice based upon their connection to these icons in the, in the Dragon Empire, right? So if you're connected to the Archmage, you get a D6 for that. You got two, connect, two dice connected to the Dwarf King. You roll all three. If any fives come up, you get a positive result, but with a drawback. If you get any sixes, you get just purely positive. And the players have a choice. The way I do it is I give them chips at the table and they can play that six or play that five. If they play the six, then it's all sunny goodness and they get to take some narrative control and let scenes, you know, work out in their favor to, and again, it's not well, it's not perfectly well-defined. And we've had players take a lot of, a lot of advantage with that, trying to do more than they probably should. And we've had players probably not ask for enough when they burn a six. Um, that would definitely be a game where if you like the idea of your characters being heroes, it definitely does a good job of keeping, keeping characters alive. Yeah. And you start out maybe not quite 
um, a hero, but second level, yeah. Yeah. Definitely second level. First level yeah. is questionable, but definitely second level and on. You're yeah. the star. Yeah, now, I don't think the intention is for you to get lots of combat boons from it, but maybe you're, you know, say, you know, Joe's group is fighting a, a giant who is up on a hill and he's got a great defensive position and he's just raining down these rocks that's just pummeling people. And Joe's character has a six with the Dwarven King, with the Dwarf King. And here's how he would play it. For those in on 13th age, he'd put in our, our table, he'd put it down, the chip on the table, say, Randy, I want to use my six. And then I would expect Joe to have a good reason to justify. He goes, well, I know that where he's positioned at, those rocks, because it's been raining, wink, wink, which means he gets to control the fact that it's been raining, right? You add that to the story right there. Because it's been raining, if I can manage a well-placed lightning bolt, that will bring his little wall down. He'll come tumbling down so we can get up there and melee him. See what I'm saying? He'd fall down the hill in like a small landslide. And I'd be like, sure, that sounds good. And to me, that's a good use of it because the players are, you know, we can't get close. He's pummeling us to death with these rocks and it makes the fight a little more stand up. That's, right. to me, that's the intention of those things. But when that comes into play, as we've seen, what's been the drawback, Joe? When we've, everybody's got chips, right? Oh yeah, everybody wants to play their chip. And things get crazy. Someone yeah. else goes, yeah, because of this, and because of that, and because of this. And then the story gets totally weird. Yeah. And uh, everybody's trying to influence it all sorts of different ways because we're not all on the same page. Too many uh, cooks in uh, in the kitchen. Yeah, our buddy Patrick's labeled that for other things. Yeah. I think for us, narrative control is a bit of a sticky wicket. We, I think we're, we were very fond of it initially, and then it started to wear thin. Um, I think... I prefer those things. Uh, I, I'm usually someone who just saw, does something real simple. Mm -hmm. So it's not too uh, far reaching for the, for the game, or it's just the way I think, oh, I, this is, a, this is, it's easy to, um, and it's easy to adjudicate. I prefer that. I was preferring that toward the end. I think the beginning of our run with 13th age, I really didn't know what to do. No, because we weren't experienced at that kind yeah. of people that have played narratively where players get control over the story part for a long time are better at it. Now, I do recall even pre third edition, maybe third edition, where I started thinking, this is funny that it came up in third edition, that, you know, I thought, well, if players, maybe something I was reading in Dragon, if players come to a tavern and they get into a tavern brawl and Joe's fighter is, you know, beat down, having a hard time because he's not good at the fisticuffs. Maybe he's a bow guy. He's fairly dexterous and not strong. And he can say, hey, um, you know, a lot of local hunters are around here. Do I see a bow just laying around? You know? And you know, he can say, or he can do maybe more, he could be more, you know, say, hey, I, I noticed one of the hunter's bows is loose on the ground. Can I pick it up? I'm going to try to pick it up. And let the players have that kind of freedom to add to the scene without it being unbelievably powerful. I mean, the, a barroom brawl is usually not intended to murder all the characters. Especially not usually. Not usually, but it can. I mean, I've done it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the point is, um, you can do little, you know, instead of saying, is there a chandelier over the table? Your rogue says, I jump up and grab the chandelier, even though the DM's never described one. And I'm comfortable with players doing that, as long as they're not, as long as it's not just giving you the win button. And I have confidence that Joe won't do that. He'll do it to make it cool and maybe to help him out as well. I mean, he's not going to do it to hurt himself, but it's not going to be, I think the problem with that narrative thing, when you get too caught up on the narrative, that you can start to hmm, feel like a win button or it starts to feel like who's, who's, the story is like going all over the place. I don't even know what's happening, at least in 13 days at our table. Because, And it could be because we're not that good at doing that. I don't know. It could be. The other thing is it can sometimes feel more like um, we're bargaining. Everybody's trying to find to, to jockey for some bargain with mm -hmm. the DM. And I, I'm not really fond of that too much so if, mm -hmm. if you're always you get in a fight and you're like oh 
I'm going to do this. What do you think? Oh, I'm going to do this. What do you think? If you're always doing that. It, I don't know. To me, that seems a little, I don't know. It seems it's a little weird. It seems like there's games out there. And I love folks calling and ask us like that. That's kind of how it plays. You like, I think about a game like Amber Diceless. Mm -hmm. I don't even, and, and I have known nothing about that game, but I know you don't use dice. And I was, I remember in, gr in grad school, had a friend um, said, Hey, Randy, you want to play this? And I was like, sure. I'd heard of, you know, Zelazny, the one that did Amber, Robert mm -hmm, Zelazny. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I was like, yeah, I've loosely heard of it. He goes, oh, you'll like it. He explained. He was a big fan of it. We rolled up, made characters. Didn't roll up. I forget what we did. Made characters. We never played, though. But I, the whole time, I, the reason I wanted to try it, I was like, how is this going to work if we don't use dice? And he explained the he explained the combat system to me. And it was about arguing and convincing each other that this is, like, I swing to punch you. Yeah, but I'm really good at fighting. So I dodge and pull your arm and flip you over. Yes, but I'm really good at tumbling. And then I tumble. You know, <laughs> and like it's it's just kind of back and forth that feels a little like story time and, yeah. and and i know not all games that use the narrative control are like that you know that use narrative adjustments for players and gms yeah i don't think that's necessarily the case i think i think, um, not, I think that kind of thing let's say during a combat yeah uh is is okay uh especially when the chips are down or you just want to kind of flourish, uh, have some sort of flourish for your character and, and be cool. Mm -hmm. But um, it shouldn't, for me, I don't want to do it all the time. Most of the time, I just want to do my thing. Roll the dice, see how things go in the combat. And then if there's some need for a some extra juice or some situation comes up, like with the bow you're talking about, Mm -hmm. What if your bow breaks or you get hit with acid and it gets destroyed? Um, if you, uh, if you, depending on how the location was described by the DM, right. if you're in a, an armory, you can expect that there's going to be maybe a yeah. replacement weapon that you can grab and just it wouldn't use. Be unreason it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that in an armory. Right. Right. But if you're in a forest, just in a clearing or something like that, you know. One of the open rangers happened to leave his bow on the tree. You might, you might be able to pick up a heavy stick and and bonk somebody with it, but. but and are yeah, the, are are the dice truly sacrosanct? I mean, let the dice fall, whatever. Joe's ninth level wizard gets bit by that spider. He's only got to roll a nine or better, or a six or better, and he rolls a two. Sorry about your luck, you're dead. I've had it had, had to happen with a Bodak. Right. You save you die. <laughs> save it death. Death and minus four, I believe. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> so, I mean, if it happens, it happens. Been so, you know, I, th I think what it is, Joe, I think it's been so long. I don't know if I deserve my title as a killer DM. I told you last week or before how I felt bad that your character might be dead. I need to stop feeling bad for you guys. You guys have okay. dice. Or choose. <laughs> I mean, if you really want the characters to survive, that's fine. But I prefer more gritty, I think, a little bit more gritty. Me, and you know what? I, I'm with you. Here's where I want it to be a game. And I, you know, I like story. You know, I do. Mm -hmm. And I like things. To, I like, you know, I, like I told you about Seven Spheres like we, last, last week. We talked about it. It ended pretty much where I, the way I wanted it to. It didn't get there the way I thought it was going, but it ended the way I wanted to. And I kind of, that feels satisfying when I get sort of where I'm hoping for. But it's also satisfying when the players change the living crap out of it and it becomes a different thing. And in the end, I guess I really want the game to be gamey with the dice. But as I'm older and becoming weak-minded, <laughs> I feel sorry for people. Like, they came to have fun. I need to stop that. I wasn't it's complaining. Game. No, I know you weren't. You, Joe was not making me feel bad. It was just me. I was like, oh, man. And, you know, years ago, I loved watching Joe make up new characters. That was one of the few joys in my life was yeah. killing Joe's character. It was a pastime of yours. It was. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> I had a thought. And it, it jumped out. <laughs> Joe but, kept no, playing. no. Um, Joe kept playing because I kept leaving that staff of power. I would just put it just out of his reach. Yeah, and he'd go, yeah. oh, can I have a staff of power? Oh my gosh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Wait until fifteenth of the staff of power, and then it hardly matters at all. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, 
So people are stuck on having a story or a particular story yeah. instead of watching a dynamic story unfold before you through dice and right. through different choices the characters make. So if one character dies, it's not that the story or the campaign dies with them. It just changes. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah. So I am preparing for Saturday with this. Oh, okay. And who this made is, that? Who this made is that? Frog God, Frog God Games, Matt Finch, the creator of um, um, Swords and Wizardry. It's just a bunch of tables, but some also some other things. Yeah, I'm it's, um, my... Hold on. It's the Tome of Adventure design for those oh, who yeah. are just listening. Yeah. Tell me adventure design, a comprehensive adventure creation source book for any fantasy role-playing game. It's been around for a while, and it's by Matt Finch. It's got tons of tables, um, and it's and not just, and they explain things. Like, for example, they have a table, just opening it right up. Was it, was it the villains that I saw? There's motivations for the villain, right? So they'll give you 20 or 30 motivations for the villain. I'm thinking, that's pretty good, but it was vague. Then I noticed the next table was each motivation with another table explaining the motivation in more detail. Oh. He, he seeks to avenge his lost love. Then he has the lost love table and give you all these ideas. So it 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 literally, I think it's literally going to, and I'm going to try to follow it and see what adventure I get. Well, might as well. <laughs> And just let it go. I mean, I have the the dryad um, thread hanging there, and I don't mind going to that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's. I want to try that. So I guess I, I want to. I also think part of this, um, um, in some people want um, are big on the continuity. Is uh, I think maybe a little. Well, apart from the fact that maybe they have a bit more attachment to their characters than they maybe they should, but mm -hmm. um, there's a bit of control, control freakiness in there, I think. Oh, for me, for sure. Right. Yeah, that's definitely, that's a fault of mine as a DM when I want to tell it. And I've, in the games we've played since the third edition era and even late, well, especially late second and Planescape being really bad for it. I mean, Dead Gods by Monty Cook was like, you had to, you're trying to tell this cool story and it's almost you have to like just keep the characters doing this thing oh don't let them don't let them go there it wasn't really i wouldn't call it a railroad but it it felt like it you know i tell you the, my, my point was with that tome of adventure design is to not i'm trying to make myself be a little more um i would use the term winging it what what word am i losing dms that are more spontaneous they kind of wing it as an improv name. improv and i'm and i can't be an improv you know i don't like me i like to be prepared but i'd like to be less detail prepared being I, I think it's fine to be prepared but don't be married to it yeah and, I, and i've noticed that if i just give myself a little wiggle room that whole thread with the dryads all i had was the comment was something's happened someone's kidnapped one of the dryads and i went off with the whole story from there when we were playing but my point is i think that amount if i use dice to do the adventure this is where dice can be valuable it can make me go in directions that i wouldn't naturally go and i wonder if people that use and i'm getting to a point i promise are more about the narrative they just say i want to tell a tale of how the adventurers overcame a king who was possessed by a demon and he did these things and they encounter these different challenges and it's going to change the characters this way. You know, I think, I think, and that's fine. If you want to, if everybody at the table want to tell that story and it's important that every character makes to the end, at least to the final combat, I guess that's okay if that's what you want to play, but it feels like not what I want these days. Hmm. I think a, a good way to do it. You can modify that a little bit by saying sure. instead of, overcome the king you could say deal with yep um and then that that keeps it potentially fluid i know yep. some some people want to have they have their story they want told yeah and the players are kind of just puppets for them but um i'm not very fond of that but don't i well, here's here's a hard question are dice, dice, 
our modules by default that um if you stick to oh. it precisely as written and if anybody you know takes a turn that's not uh you know not allowed mm -hmm. you, you gray out and say yeah there's nothing over there or whatever i mean A module, even in even in um, if you're being Im an improv person, mm -hmm. you can't have an un a dungeon that doesn't really have uh, that's amorphous, right? You can do you can do the quantum ogre thing if yes. you want, yep. um, where it doesn't really matter where the which way the characters go you say yeah Find you want to go ogre. left or right yeah whatever blah 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 Find here's an ogre friend. here's an ogre three rooms from now doesn't matter which way you go you're going to see the ogre that's quantum ogre i think it's kind of lame but some people do do that but um if you draw up a map in advance even if it's not a module you have your own mm -hmm. you're there's only so many different ways you can go. And if a character says, well, I know you, you, it, uh, there's a hallway to the left or the right, or uh, the left and the right and straight ahead. But you know, I want there to be a, stair a stairway right in the middle that I can, I, you're not gonna do that. And I think there's some games that encourage you to do that kind of play. Yeah. But I don't know, I don't know them. So um, when hmm. you have, you know, that kind of thing is fine. And that's not, too railroady uh, as long as it's not the quantum thing where no matter where you go you end up at the dungeon okay so this is a, okay so how about this fuck we're getting down the railroad thing but let me think about this is there a situation to so so would you say then you want when, when you're playing now you want the dice to be the rulers of everybody's fate Right, where where appropriate. And, and I mean, player choice too. But where when you're rolling dice, where appropriate, yeah. We, we've talked about we're not we're not into the fudging thing. No, no fudging and attack so, rolls or saving throws, none of that. You know, so you, you roll, played, you miss, you miss. And if you played your character for four roll years, you fail that one roll. S O L. Yeah, okay. that's why you might want to have a few backup characters. Yep. Um, you can you can do it to where they're not just walking in out of the blue as well especially if you're high enough level and have enough wealth to have retainers, you can just have one of your retainers become a PC and they're in the continuity of the whole thing. Or yeah. they could, there could be an NPC in, in the town or in a nearby place or somewhere that you've had dealings with mm -hmm. uh, and they're part of the continuity of the story. So it's not like someone just walking on stage from up nowhere Right. So there's ways to do it that that uh, that probably would make a lot more sense than just making up a brand new character that nobody's ever heard of. But you're not opposed. Like, I know, I know, because I play with you. You're not opposed to a little narrative freedom to make scenes come alive, have a little more juice, be interesting. Oh, sure, as, sure. As long as we have to be careful. I think the chip thing in 13 days is a little too much control. Um, well, it's, too, it's in danger of being too things just getting crazy bill unless all the players aren't a perfect if the players are perfectly aligned in the in the usage of their chips um we have some players that are good with our buddy dave he, he's good at supporting with mm -hmm. chips not so much railroading you know derailing ideas um yeah so hmm so going on the idea of the dice we talked a little bit about failing forward in the past binary results or failing forward or especially in D D, or say scaled success you know you, you got to pick a lot if you roll one to a five no chance at all you blew it trap goes off you roll a six to a ten the trap goes off but you see it coming so you get a plus two you're safe you roll 11 through 15 you disarmed it you roll 16 or higher you disarm it without even you get past it and you can leave it set if you want to because you managed to bypass it and keep it set so do you, or do you like pass fail? Or either, like, either it probably yeah. depends on the situation. Right. I don't but think, not, I don't mm -hmm. think it matters one way or another, as far as narrative control, you can have a little bit in there, Yeah. I suppose, but um, scaled successes depending on die rolls are still die rolls. Mm -hmm. 
do they have to, with like 13th age, <laughs> many skill checks are never failures. You always succeed, but with the price, that's the fail forward mechanic. Mm. So if you roll one, yeah, you still, I mean, I guess so if you roll a one, you still pick the lock. And what system? 13th age. Oh, I didn't know that about 13th age. Oh, there's age. everything's, there's, there's essentially no, I want to say there can be fails, but most of the time, if it's something important, like we need to get inside this before the guards come down the hall, get inside this room, go thief. He rolls a one. I'd prefer, I mean, that's the way that system works. I guess that's okay, but I would prefer having some chance of just completely failing. Mm -hmm. And then even if you want to have some graduated success mechanics after that, that's fine too. It's all, right. it's all dice anyway. Right. But um, if there's no chance of, well, with, with skill checks, it's right. not that way with combat. No. However, you can still do damage on a miss. So it's kind of like that. I don't like that in combat. And I know that's not, I don't think that's, it's a little, I think it is half and half. I think it's half. And they literally say something like this. You don't want the players to feel bad. Player characters never makes attacks that do nothing. They never totally miss because they're because in this game, you are the heroes. You're not just protagonist. You are the heroes that legend said would one day come. I mean, you can literally run stories like that perfectly fine in 13 days. Sure, sure. You guys are the legendary heroes. You were born under the sign of the of the midnight sun. And guess what? You're saving the kingdom from the Lich King. And guess right. what? You will. <laughs> i mean if you run it you will yeah yeah you will because um you will it's just the way <laughs> yeah, it's but, this way it's so good. it's interesting so then that game has it baked in this idea of failure is not really a thing that happens i mean there's consequences so when you, if you roll that one pick in the lock maybe the trap goes off maybe an alarm sounds so you now you now the fight you're going to have with the mummy that's guarding this is going to be exacerbated by the lich's minions who heard you down right. the hall so, I mean, that could be, an, they, they call that a, a quote unquote loss that you fail. That's their failure. But you and I both know it's not the same as you couldn't get in there. And D&D &D says you're level four rogue. Guess what? You don't get to try again to your level five. And here comes six whites. Roll initiative. That, that's <laughs> why having, having it set up that if you fail a single check, of us any sort mm -hmm. just pick one out of the, out of a hat sure you you step up to the beginning of the adventure and you fail a check you cannot continue right so, so that's you're... how people harp on the binary mechanic and saying it's bad because that can happen well i'm going to say why did you build it that way in the first place that's a good argument i have another argument so what yeah, and so what? And so what? Do something. You get, so do something else. You have to jump this chasm to be able to get. Like I'm thinking, like in Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, when Aragorn goes inside the mountain and calls those ghosts back to fulfill their oaths, and the and the uh, wall of skulls comes rolling down, and he and Gimli and Legolas are waiting through there. Everybody's got to make their dex check. If they don't, they may go rolling on down with those skulls over into a chasm. Mm -hmm. okay or maybe you, you you can't get through it so you get blocked and you can't get to those men under the mountain right my thought is you know what that means is okay if it's bad luck maybe you could maybe you are at the right level where you could possibly achieve it but not now now you got to find a new way around that just pushes the players to be more creative in my mind i mean at least i'm saying that i think i like that better um, i lean toward that more now though i can see the argument why is the dm setting a situation where if you fail the, you can't play tonight we don't right. get to play the dm better be ready if he's gonna if he's gonna play like that right and what what uh, to pick on um lord of the rings a little bit more what if when they were being chased through uh, the mines of moria and that staircase was falling apart yep and one after the other because there were several places where saving throws could have been mm -hmm. botched there was all kinds of they were making all kinds of yeah, throws, yeah 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 so that in a lot of games that could be done narratively yep right because that's the way a lot of games roll but in D, &D, D yeah in D, D you might do that 
by skill checks. And, you know, if you have to make four or five skill checks or saving throws successively, mm -hmm. you're going to blow one. Right. And, uh, yeah, so Frodo could have easily fallen into the abyss, Aragorn, all, any one of them. Right. Uh, so is, is it bad design? Well, the game thing is, right. Make, make four or five checks. I think we often, and we make we're making these comparisons with a, a book slash movie. Mm -hmm. uh, when the game isn't either, right? So our expectations shouldn't be that it should be like the movie, where I can we can you know have this sequence of events that seem dangerous, but the guys make it. But is some it, would say we want our experience to be more like a yeah. movie and it feels cool to them. But you and I would say, yeah, but you never were really in danger. What yeah. was the fun in that? Uh, yeah. The fun is you imagining. It's it's probably, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I don't think it's very. Imagination. Yeah. <laughs> I would prefer um, to roll it out. And if someone falls, someone falls. If the whole party ends up falling, well, maybe you made a maybe you made a trap that was a little bit too too much for the party, and everybody rolls or, up. Or maybe, or maybe it was easy. I mean, it's possible with four players. They could all blow it. You can all blow it and say that was really hard. I said, dude, the DC was eight. Yeah, and you all rolled twos and threes. I don't yeah. know what I'm supposed to do. And, right. and I would argue, well, you're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> it does and that doesn't mean the campaign's over no still it just means new characters come in and pick up the pieces um uh, maybe the dm has to shift gears a little bit i don't think you need to retcon or mm -hmm. anything like that um we should be we should be okay with the story evolving at the table if you want to call it a story or if you just want to call it the game Mm -hmm. for there there are folks who don't even like the word story to be associated with role-playing games <laughs> well i find of... that weird because i do think there's a story to tell afterwards sure We're sitting down with our at friend the very least and, and they're like hey how, how'd your campaign go you played last year and we're like oh dude let me tell you this we yeah. start telling the story and i guess they could say well you're just telling the story of your gaming experience okay but i've always thought rpgs do have a story element to them yeah. It does. I don't like them. They're not novels of the table. Um, I'm not inclined to want to play novels of the table or movies of the table. When we take um, some cues from them, and we use words like cinematic yeah. um, so that we want certain elements of the game experience to feel a particular way. Mm -hmm. But I think expecting your character to win or right. um, from first to seventh level is our first to 20th level or whatever endpoint it is for the campaign expecting mm -hmm. them to make it um uh, is bad idea yeah well i'd rather not know it's like right. a spoiler it's like having a spoiler we are it's mm -hmm. like um okay movies where or tv shows where you have um, where it opens up where there's an obvious bad thing like an earthquake or an explosion or a, a building burned down and you have a dude who's sitting on the side who's the main character who you know just survived because he's sitting there mm -hmm. and then they do the 24 hours late uh, prior right. or yeah. earlier you well you know he's made it mm -hmm. so his oh, there's I, no oh, i hates that and that's a very i feel like i could be wrong did supernatural bring that into popularity they did it a lot. Oh, I remember it was seeing them so lot. much. They but it's a TV. I think it's a TV trope. And then there's a lot of movies that have done that. I don't think that they're the the first. Right. You know, they just use it a lot. Right. Well, tell me this. I'm going to ask a question that I think you've answered different. I'm, I'm going to be intrigued to tell you the answer to this because I've asked this before. I'm just going to ask it. So if I were to say, hey, Joe, we're going to play a campaign and the characters are the, are the heroes. And so, like, your character cannot die until the final scene a would you want to play that i mean could you play it and would you enjoy it or b and b do you think that's is that a way to play that you would find um you think is i don't know forget b would you enjoy could you I enjoy could. 
I could, yeah. it wouldn't be my prefer preference. I might screw around a bit and say, Hey, there's a cliff. I'm going to jump off. Right. <laughs> what are you going to do with that DM? Yeah. <laughs> you see a magic fluffy bed just appears midstream and catches you and falls down with you. I mean, right. I don't know. So yeah, you could. Um, I might definitely push the envelope on that. What if you were told you won't I, die unless, yeah. unless you purposely do something stupid? Right. Then it wouldn't be as bad. Well, it's interesting because I think some people, when they sit down to play, and we talked about this with Pathfinder 3.x, if you spend, we're going to build eighth level characters, we're going to campaign to 26 level or whatever, we're going to play into the epic epic tiers. Build your character with 2,000, get 25,000 gold pieces to buy magic items, and we're going full on 3.x. And you spend, I mean, people are going to spend, some folks will spend three, four, five hours, six hours building that character and tweaking him. Joe probably wouldn't anymore. He'd just go, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I know this will work, and I'll play this too. And um, But then that character that spent six hours in like first encounter, oh, look, the remora is critical. He swallowed you. Oh, look, 20 roll. Yeah, his, he does double damage inside his furnace stomach. Take 87 damage, and you're a rogue. You're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean... And the Remoraz is a Remoraz, he's perfectly valid combat for eighth level characters. That is a, um, if you have a game system that encourages or requires, or it's part of the game to spend hours laboring over crafting mm -hmm. your small batch character, mm -hmm. batch of one, you know, mm -hmm. it's handcrafted, <laughs> organic. <laughs> <laughs> small batch character uh i think i finally know what small batch means now that you put I, like you said that before and I'm like what is small batch now i get it yeah 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 mm -hmm. um <laughs> then i can understand why people get upset and there's all these articles and posts on the interwebs about you mm -hmm. know you should be really thoughtful and you should use the cr system as intended yeah about killing characters because it can be traumatic for the player. Mm -hmm. And um, I say, screw all that. The system, I think um, character generation should be quick. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, there's a problem with the system. It shouldn't take forever to make a character. Or, well, or, or, or you should be totally okay with if you decided to spend hours pouring over the books yep. and uh, crafting a backstory that's 50 pages long mm -hmm. but at the but when you get to the table you should be ready for instant death in a D, &D type game i agree and i think again even like pathfinder i would say because you know that's how a lot of times that's how i was with tradition look you felt four seven 47 hours building this character I really don't care. That was your choice. Because even me, we, we, we laugh in our group how crappy I build characters. But I can build a decent character mm -hmm. with the player's handbook from third edition. Right. I can build a fighter. I can build a wizard. I can build a rogue. I can build a cleric. I can build a decent character. I won't be the king, but mm -hmm. I won't be pure suckitude. And I won't take five hours. Right. If I just need a character quick, give me the player's handbook. I'll be done in 30 minutes. Even right now, it would take me all of 30 minutes to build a six level character. Yeah. I wouldn't buy anything special, but I'd be fine. I'd be effective. Right. And my thought is how much bang you expect them for your buck. And I guess if the group says, hey, build characters that are, in, you know, intimately connected to this story because the DM wants to do that, I guess that's fine. But if it's like, hey, we're going to play the rules, the dice, the dice fall the way they may, live with it. It's your choice to spend nine hours building that character in his background. It's Joe's choice to spend 20 minutes Googling something real quick. And say, oh, that's a cool feat. I'll take that. Right. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. So um, there's good ways to spend your time. The best time to spend is at the table with your pals. Um, yeah. If you really enjoy the build game, which I did for a while. Yeah. It can be fun, but it can also be I spent hours on this character and, and didn't get to play it or spent hours on this character and they died, spent hours on this character and it still sucks, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. So what do you think of this with, with the dice fall? If we play the dice fall, the dice roll things, and if you use old AD&D, you're traveling the wilderness. Wilderness was a dangerous, dangerous place because there, were, if I remember correctly, I don't know if there were leveled encounters for the wilderness. In fact, I'm pretty sure there weren't. 
So you guys go traveling in the narrow wood in our campaign. And I say, oh, it says Bulette. Mm-hmm. We're, we're third level. Is that is that the DM? I rolled it, dude. Right. Well, is that, is that me being a jerk? Or am I only a jerk if I give you no other option but to fight it? I think that's probably turn the corner and fight the Bulet. It's kind of ridiculous because the Bulet isn't going to be above ground waiting for you to turn around that tree. And you're going to be, plus they're gigantic. Yes. Well, they're nine feet long. So oh, yeah, nine feet long and about six feet wide. And they're basically, they're land they're massive. They're, yeah. they're massive. They're massive. Mostly, mostly mouth. Yeah. Right, right. Under some circumstances, you may not see it coming, but most of the time you are because it's going to be going through the ground and getting ready to munch on you. I so, would let you, yeah. So you're going to, there's going to, plus there may, you, you could, I think the best way to present something like that is to have some sort of distance. Mm-hmm give the characters an out if they want to take it um or some sort of warning sign like um big gigantic claw marks on the trees maybe furrows of ground that have been disturbed by its passing not sure not sure how i don't think that they glide through the ground like they're melded into it they they used to i know in third edition they did they had Uh, an an earth glide ability so you oh. couldn't necessarily see where they came from, but I would be inclined in our game to do exactly that. Or like, you know, say you traveling through a field next to the woods and you see this beautiful stag come out at about 80 yards and your ranger goes, Oh, that could be dinner. He strings his bow and then up from the ground, a sp- you know, a spray of dirt and clods of rock swap. And you see this massive mouth, take this huge stag and pull it down to the ground. Right. He starts munching on it and you go, Oh my God. And I describe it. And you're, Oh my God, that's a bullet run. Get right. to the rocks, get to the high grounds, you know, or if you're, and if your players are dumb and they're like, well, it's much less, let's attack it so we can kill it. Okay. Good luck. Especially <laughs> our characters right now, they're third oh, level. Party third levels. I mean, there's no, I, hope. no, no, way. no. I mean, if it was that size creature, but without the defenses it has, it's All really right. hard. It has a pretty high armor class, doesn't it? Yeah. Over 20. Yeah. It's really hard to hit. It says, I want to say it's 2021, 20, something like that. Yeah. In AD and D, it used to have like three armor classes: shell, the back. Oh yeah, the yeah. And the it's belly. I. Zero, zero, two, and four. I think it was zero. No, the eyes were small, so it was either the head. You could attack an armor class of four. The back, because it was shelled, was an armor class of two. No, I had it backwards. The back was armor class of zero. The face was a two because it had a little bit of shell on there and if you get to its underbelly it was a four and i used to always wonder i guess it was called shots i never understood how ad and d you got to attack how you chose the way you got to attack things how do i get to pick its face or its back i mean does the player just say i'm going to do it and you let them that seems cheesy okay i'm, I'm going to choose to attack its underbelly even though it's on all fours and it's trying to chomp you you're right. just going to be able to stab it in the belly get out of here yeah yeah, I don't, I don't know how you would do that unless it's you ready an attack, which you couldn't do in the old game. Um, you could ready... call sh- there was a called shot rule. Was that in the Dragon magazine that we used for a while? I'm, well, there's all kinds of alternate rules in there. I'm sure they had one, but or, or um, several. But um, I would say since they can leap in the air, yeah, right, because you did that. Yeah, they could. You, yes. you, the, quite the impressively mis- yeah and you could ready an action for it to leap and if it leaps over you know leaps up you can attack its underbelly otherwise it'd be hard to get to i get they have powerful legs on a side note i used to always i love that ability because that was a good way to kill people but mm-hmm. um i you in particular but yes. i always wondered why can they jump a stupid bullet then i thought about it maybe it was this maybe not you know great whites can come out of the out of the water by about six feet mm-hmm. 14 foot fish all teeth can come out of the water its whole body six feet right dolphins that, do that too but i mean a great white yeah. that's terrifying yeah 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 <laughs> definitely so, yeah some say that um it was made as a counter or a challenge to mounted um, yeah. characters uh, they're a good challenge for mounting characters because right. it will hit your horse and kill it in one shot. Yeah. And they, and you, you can have it do that too. If the players are being a little bit, you know, say you do a, 
you warn them, hey, um, you know, the, some local farmer as you're traveling up to the, the Dungeon of Doom up more in the mountains, he goes, hey, don't don't take, there's a shortcut that goes around the forest, but to the east, there's a, a, stri a strip of land a few miles long. That's Bulet country. You don't want to go there. And the players are like, you know, it's getting dark. I want to get there today. Let's cut through there. And I'd be like, okay. Then I roll and I roll the encounter. I would still probably give them a chance, but then I would be less likely to use the stag. I would probably have them show up and I would have it come barreling at them. And if they could take off, I'd give them a chance with initiative to get away. But if they didn't, I would have it probably hit their, hit one of their horses. So it hit their horse, not, you know, not probably hit your horse, not Joe yeah, off his horse. Yeah. And then uh, just munch on the horse and you guys could boogie, right. you know, but I would, but if you decide to stay and fight it, I'd be like, all right, I'll, I'll kill everybody. We can roll new characters. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's how I want to act anyway. Are, are there games? <laughs> we played games like 13th age. I don't remember. Did aliens I have it on there in the notes, but did aliens, it didn't have a narrative mechanics. Did it much? I don't remember them. Um, They had. The new aliens they, RPG. Huh? The new Aliens RPG we played at Cabin Con. That one. They had, uh, the characters were all connected story-wise. Right. So you could consider that some sort of narrative thing, but I don't know about mechanic. I didn't, I never looked at the rules. I just, you know, you told me what to roll when it was time to roll. So. Yeah, because we don't, we don't, you, yeah. Hadley's hope, that, that scenario was, was kind of, just before Aliens 2, the second Aliens movie, it was set on that planet, but it was set up in such a way that it was a story, but you guys could make changes. I mean, you could have been, some of you got away and you could have theoretically been successful, but there was a lot of things against you guys, everybody getting out. Yeah, there so, wasn't any kind of token that you could use or points no, or anything like that that you no. could turn in for narrative control. Or, and there was no resource to manage that. No. And it wasn't, it was, I don't think it was encouraged by the rules either, but aliens but, is also- But, but you yeah. don't need it. You might want it so that so players don't over uh, use their ability to just talk mm -hmm. and just say, "Hey, this does this sound okay?" Blah 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 blah. Because you, you don't need currency to do narrative control. You don't need a resource except to rein in greedy people, perhaps. Yeah, and, and I think at the table, the DM just says, mm, "No, nah, that's too much." Right. You're trying to do too much. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm so. Do you think uh, this narrative? I don't think narrative control is too much for us. I think we just we just need a small taste of it. We we like a small taste of it in our games. We're not as inclined to let the players decide, you know, and I don't want to say infect the story, but infect the situation with too much control from the player side. Right. So, I mean, so the players have narrative control already by making choices however mm -hmm. meaningful those choices that the dm allows them to be so yeah. um aka quantum ogre your choice isn't really a choice or right. uh, dms that have multiple things prepared so that if you don't go left you go right instead he has something ready for you but right. so you have some narrative control especially right. as you go to town what do you do in town unless mm -hmm. you gloss over and do town stuff by just yeah well, let's talk through we uh, buy a few things spend the night at the tavern um get drunk and then we go back out on out right. the next day you could gloss right. it over that way or you could play it out and there's some narrative things that can happen there without needing you know currency or anything like that um so it all depends on the table what the dm will allow the players to do what how much free reign they can have and what uh the players want to do they may not care yeah. Now, I don't mind a game like um, Savage Worlds, where they get when the new current version where they give you bennies, and because bennies are used, they're basically your hit points too. If you take, if you're if you're dying, the only way to soak wounds is with bennies. So bennies can be used to give you re rolls to soak wounds. And now in the current version of the game, it's spelled out. You can let players take some narrative control by using a benny. I don't mind that because there's a stack of things that you want to use your bennies for probably only a very foolish player is going to be using his chip every single time to do narrative control especially if it's not meant to be i think they even spell it out it's not meant to be a game saving combat bonus right right yeah because if you spend all your chips on narration and then it comes down to fight and you can't soak wounds you <laughs> go down fast you will real quick 
Yeah. If you can't slow wounds, you're going to get beat down. That is true. So let's see. We've done the binary stuff. I think we tackled it pretty well. I think we fixed it. Yeah, tonight. yeah. I think, yeah. Um, some, yeah, we're, we're a light touch on players' narrative control. Yeah, I think that's kind of our our deal. I'd be interested to hear others what they think if we've missed something. Maybe they would describe narrative control in a different way or how they like it better. Or if they don't, if they agree with us, Dice is cool. Give us a call or email or something. It'd be great to hear from other people. So yeah, think- comment comment on the video in YouTube. Send us an email. There's all kinds of ways. I'm going to change the way um, I'm changing the the show note structure a little bit. I'm going to have um, a list of um, links that people can follow to interact oh, in okay. the show notes okay so i'll uh i think i'll forward that to you so you can include it in Adjust the outline time. yeah yes sounds good all right cool so uh moving along um mm-hmm. like it love it or leave it yeah so who went first last time was that you or was that me it was probably you <laughs> because i had to yeah. make up my stuff on the fly okay yeah so you want to go first this time except i'm still making mine up on the fly. okay then i'll go first yeah I'll, I'll give you time to think all right like it love it or leave it for joseph holiday food i love it thanksgiving I mean, thanksgiving christmas which is weird because it's a lot, a lot of times it's exactly the same thing the july 4th picnic food oh, really yeah. food. it's all good halloween candy well I wouldn't call that food exactly. I'm not a big candy guy. I'm I really, yeah, I'm not either. I'm more into cake or pie or cookies, stuff like that. I used to love pie and cake. <laughs> Dang gluten. Oh, yeah. you can't have them. Not really. <laughs> I should not. Have more for up. me. Such a pie hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of that, Halloween. I like it. Used to... I don't know. I think like is probably it's always been like. Never been a big love. Not really. I'm not uh, really all that into costumes. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. But I like looking at other people's costumes. Now, I'm guessing you've not been to this. I know you've never been to an RPG convention, but what is your thought in general of pop culture conventions? comic conventions rpgs cosplay anime whatever you know cards used to be collected i don't know if they have them anymore like baseball cards and stuff they usually go to in others and like gen con has a lot of those things there too what's your general take on pop culture conventions i may have asked something like this before it's more broad though i've never really been to one right star trek things like that the idea sounds good but it seems like a lot of effort (laughs) so so (laughs) <laughs> for something you're not all that excited about i like comic books mm-hmm. i don't care to get autographs oh i think it's weird me neither i i, I don't I, i'm not inclined to do that um i can no, easily us. see somebody's commentary online or whatever i don't have to meet luminaries it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't appeal to me no desire to go to Comic Con and meet Tony Stark or uh, what's his name, Robert Downey Jr. Not really, because yeah. a lot of times you get you get kind of disappointed. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that haven't been, and right? I, I'm sure Robert Downey Jr. is very charismatic, right? But this, you still don't know if that's who that is. You're just and, going there to see his persona. Is it really? Can, is it really him? And even if it is or isn't, it's like, I don't know this dude. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to get to say to him, dude. I like your movies. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. How many times has he heard that? Though he probably likes it. No, you know? I mean, who wouldn't like I would like it. Like, Randy, I like the way you teach uh, differential equations. And I'd be like, right. thanks. That's really cool. It makes me feel, I get that a lot. Being a rock star math, math teacher. Right. I mean, I can <laughs> say I probably be, would be more interested in in uh, maybe meeting folks in the RPG arena because they seem like more like real people. Yeah. And maybe you can talk about um, game design issues or or things like that. 
Um, I definitely, I definitely felt connected when I went to that one comic convention a few months ago with a small group here in Michigan, the smaller publishers, they were definitely, I mean, they were like, when you bought their stuff, they, Hey, would you, and they, you could tell they wanted to, would you like me to sign this for you? And I was like, sure. You know? And it's like, but I'm like, I don't know them from Adam and you know, it's, it's fine, but yeah. 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 I'm not going to, I'm not downing anybody that likes that stuff. It's just not me. Uh, no, no. All right. That was my three holiday food, Halloween and pop culture conventions. What you got for me? Birds as pets. Oh, leave it. I'm asking no. that because we just picked up a couple. <laughs> well, your wife likes all animals, Mr. Ventura. Yes. So but birds, I don't personally, eh, I, I don't get it. I mean, I mean, our cats would probably try to kill them. I, I don't, they, they don't do anything. Birds don't seem to do anything for me. I've never had a bird for a pet. I also feel the same way about fish. Though I'm coming around on fish. Because I, I have finally seen what someone says. They say, watching fish are relaxing. And it kind of is. I was at an aquarium in Nashville. And it, I was like, it was a big one, of course. I was like, wow, this is pretty chill. And I was sitting there for like, I found myself sitting for like 30 minutes. I was at a convention, a math convention. So, you know, terribly exciting. But I was by myself at lunch in Nashville. And I went to this aquarium. And I was like, before I was waiting to go into my restaurant. And I was just realized time just passed like that. And that was pretty cool. So I can see that, but birds, eh, I don't know. You don't, do you pet them? Do you hold them? You can, depends on which, right. uh, what kind. Okay. In other words, that talk, the ones that talk could be kind of fun. So, you know, probably mostly leave it with a little bit of like it if I had one of those. I know, there's, not, um, a there's, a, there's a variety of birds that speak, mimic. There, yeah, there's a couple online. I may, may forward one of them to you that will, they'll play music. Mm -hmm. and then the bird dances oh okay well it moves around but it's all right it's i've seen them their heads will bob, bob and, and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. 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 but uh, you like the aquarium thing mm -hmm. there they can be interesting to look at and mm -hmm. watch and whatnot mm -hmm. but that kind of goes away when you try to when you get to the maintenance side of it you can get oh, lucky yeah. and, and have a nice balance of stuff in there, and then it kind of can be self uh, maintaining. Yeah, you know, there's, you know, there's cleaner fish, right, to keep the tank clean if you if you can get it right. Right, but yeah. it's it's uh it can be um, it can be difficult to get to there. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say mostly leave it with birds. That's bad. Um, skulls. <laughs> skulls, very cool. If it's um pretend skull you know you don't want to have a lot uh, an actual human skull no i really don't want that i don't <laughs> want the bones and the dice none of that weirdo stuff i'm not yeah i just don't see the point in all that so skulls are i would say leave it. i got no use for a skull <laughs> got no use for a skull unless it's maybe design some cool oh sweet joe showing a skull it's um actually has a removable uh, oh. lower jaw Is i'm not a, really okay. sure why it's well i think it's because it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a um um cast from an a real human skull this is this is oh. not a human skull this right, is not right. a real one it's looks like one it's really it's really well done I was gonna it, was it an anatomy or physiology kind of class thing it wasn't no i saw it um got it as a Christmas present. Oh, small, which is Christmas for Halloween. <laughs> but uh, it was very inexpensive it, I, when I mm -hmm. saw it. Oh, um, if you ever heard of a, I don't even know if they do much these days because it's from China. The uh, app Wish, you can get, I believe that's where I got that. It took forever to get here, but um, it was real cheap. I think it was only $10 or something like that. Wow. hardly anything hmm. and uh yeah i just I was like going through the there's like there's a skull there oh it's really cheap and it really looks um it's well made yeah i mean it'd be a great prop for halloween great prop for a game even if you had or you know for somebody that was you know something and they see a demi lit skull that'd be okay i'm Pop not really thing. into skulls i don't have like <laughs> I mean, you never, I don't have clothing that has, I mean, there's people like my wife loves skulls. She has 
shoes with skulls, socks with skulls, shoelaces with skulls, t-shirts, pants, all but they're all pink, things. right? They're all pink. No, <laughs> they vary. Yeah, I know they vary, yeah. but I don't have any. That's the only skull I have. Hey, as long as you got one, I have one, but it's still attached. So yes, well, I guess I have. I do, I do, I do like that one currently. My own yes. skull. Yes. Mm -hmm. Snow. Snow, like it. Loved it when I first moved to Michigan. Um, generally speaking, for about a month or two, I really like it a lot. Um, of course, when I was younger, I was living in the old house. I did all the shoveling. I still liked it. I didn't mind it. Never really got tired of the shoveling till maybe the last. So after about 10 years here in Michigan, it used to be love and it's dropped to like. And now if I had to shovel my own driveway, nah, I wouldn't like it so much. So I know you probably don't care for snow being a mailman. Well, if I never see any more snow the rest of my life, I'll be a happy man. As long <laughs> as I'm a mailman, that is. <clears throat> Once I retire and I can pay some punk kid to, to, <laughs> to uh, clear my Public driveway, problem. then that's bucks, fine. Bucks. Yeah. No, by the time we're that age, it'll be a hundred bucks probably. <laughs> I know. And I'm like, you know what? We'll just get a four wheeler. We'll, we'll get a four wheeler. We'll get a uh, snow blower. Four by four. Drive right over it. Chains. Yeah. Screw the roads. Sounds good. When we get there, we won't need any roads. <laughs> no. All right. So moving on to the mud. Are we ready for the mud? Let's play in the mud. All right. So we, okay. Uh, you wrote these up. So you wanted yeah. to talk about the, the core uh, classes yeah, beyond so the four standard. It's probably too soon, but when I have five, six players at the table and we've got Druid, or sorry, we've got Cleric Fighter, uh, Rogue, and Wizard, Magic User, um, I got to thinking about do we need more classes? Now, granted, with four, we got we got the Halfling, uh, the Half-Elf, no, the Halfling, the Elf, the Dwarf, and the Human. So you have four, four, four races, four classes, which is a 16 combination. You can do 16 different characters. Mm -hmm. you know which is race class combo um but i do think when you know if you come to the table we talk about patrick who wanted to kind of he, he loves wizards we got five players then somebody's got to be doubled up somewhere on the class and if we got four you can kind of feel obligated to quote unquote fill in the party but again my opinion is do whatever you want but i thought are there other classes that we want um and you did a really quick Write up of the druid not too long ago and sent it to me, and I have expanded upon that. Um, what other classes, though? Besides, I'm, I think I want a druid, but I'm not sure I want a ranger. Why is that? Is he needed? None of them are. Well, when I say that, Joe, I mean you have people niche... that are woodsmen and hunters. It's okay. iconic. It is iconic. So maybe the ranger needs to be there. That's, you know, that's funny, though, through the additions of D&D, &D, the Ranger has always been the most, the class that's caused the most arguments. That's because while having a hunter or woodsman is iconic, like the Ranger from, it's because it's the, it's Ranger. Right. It's from, um, didn't they just, didn't, wasn't that his name? Who? Where did, the, where, where did the word Ranger come from? I want to say Tolkien. it was Tolkien. Because he called Strider, he was a ranger from the north. Yes. So yeah. that's where D D got it from. Mm -hmm. I mean, primarily. There might somewhere else in Appendix N might have other rangers, but that's pretty much the iconic ranger. But what right. does it do? Right. So somehow um druid and magic user spells were added were were part of the ranger class in uh um first edition um and and ranger got druid spells did he, get, did he get druid spells in first edition yeah druid and magic user oh both yes yeah yeah and mm -hmm. i always wondered why and after rereading and and fairly recently watching um lord of the rings i still don't know why <laughs> right 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 um uh, but I can see why you could um, dispense with Ranger as a class because you could just have some sort of talent skill, talent background where mm -hmm. you know how to hunt, 
where you know how to survive out in the wilderness uh, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's also like Beastmaster type, which is iconic, has been around, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kicking around uh, the D and D, um, Dragon Magazine articles, uh, uh, subclass territory for different versions of the game. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a Beastmaster in fifth edition. Let me read through what I have written for the Druid. I've, I've taken what you had and moved and did a lot more with it, I think. Uh, first of all, I'm trying to give a title, like in, in the D&D books where they say, this is what a Druid is. I said, here's my idea right now. And this is just a quick write-up. A defender of nature who can attract a, a companion animal, change shape, and sometimes tap into the primal energy, primal energy of nature to perform a variety of magical effects called Druid magic. My idea is Druidic, or druidic magic. Druidic magic adapted from the spell list that we're using, the rule cyclopedia or whatever. Um, it's not going to be, I don't want it to be necessary, just like the just like the lawgiver. I'm not sure I want it to be classified in the game as spells. They may just get some abilities. Likely fifth, sixth, or seventh level is the highest. Um, I, I kind of want them to have a different power source. I don't like the druid. I really don't like in rule cyclopedia how the druid's like an off, you're a cleric to a certain level, then you become a druid if you want to. That just seems really weird to me. I guess they're just saying you're a, but you're a spe you got to learn to be a cleric first and then you can become a druid. That's weird. Well, I, I think it's uh, from the point of view that either there's a god of nature that mm -hmm. you revere or nature itself is such that it can uh, is a um, divine source that you get your stuff from. But I don't think the rule cyclopedia lets you become a druid until a higher level. Correct. Which is weird. And then you get access to new spells. So I'm thinking I'm going to have some sort of primal energy or nature's energy or nature's way or something initially where they can pull from a pool of resources. And I might do a point system. I'm kind of enamored of that with a lawgiver. Um, but I'm not, I'm the druid, I would imagine. Well, let me finish. So they're going to have a shape changing at various levels. I want, no, this is where I'm not kind at of first level. No, no. Oh, uh, well, currently I have them at first level, but that can change. Uh, that's a mistake, I think. Okay, that's fine. This is just, I don't disagree. Um, various levels. Um, my idea is to let them have like a complete shape change. And I want to kind of take the 13th age idea or the Eberron idea and have a shifter form where the druid can be fighting in his animal form. Ah. Meaning a humanoid, almost like yeah, a yeah. hybrid. Um, now we can, I mean, I'm with you. Low level, maybe no. I was, I had it delineated. I called it the wolf form at level one. Any normal, non-flying, non-water breathing animal of medium or smaller size. And then at level five was the bear tiger. I'm, I'm going to give these forms a name. And then a bear tiger is any non-flying, non-water breathing animal of large size or smaller. And I'm not giving them the ability to fly until ninth level or swim in the water. So they can't they're not going to be they're going to be not it's going to be it's called the avian or aquatic form and then at higher level i have like dire wolf form then i have level 17 dire bear form and then level 20 perfect animal form those are all question marks i have no sure, idea sure, how sure, it's sure. Be. early those days are, yeah early days and i did change their starting goal you had them at a d8 times 10 i turned it to a d4 times 10 because i want them to be Pull. I copy pasted. Yeah. Um, okay. They're probably not. Oh, I can see you. You didn't do that on purpose. Yeah. 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 It's clear. So yeah. clerics were D8s, I think. Yes. Um, so, but that makes sense. They probably don't have a lot to, that they need money for. Yeah. I, I kind of want them to be not exactly wild men, but to be, you know, nature's ally. They're kind of known as being odd. They tend to either keep to themselves or live in the forest or in the wilderness nearby. But I would love the idea of making the animal, the shape change part. It doesn't have to be at first level, but I would like it to become a core part of their ability as a warrior type. So I'm seeing them as a warrior, kind of a lawgiver type where they have, they're a warrior caster cross, cross class kind of combo. So I don't want them casting like wizards. I don't, not down with the creeping doom. I'm not down with some of the crazier spells, but maybe spells that help them be more animalistic and do get animal powers and abilities what do you yeah, think dru well druids are another one that it came from <laughs> lore and yeah. what did they really what were they really about mm -hmm. um so you you could really just take it anywhere so yeah sure sure i'm just yeah i'm just druids, asking you. druids um 
have always been kind of a hodgepodge like Rangers, uh, except different versions of the game, they got to be able to cast ninth level spells. Yes. Oh, so, so the clerics eventually. And clerics, right. That's because clerics did. So, of course, druids did because druids right. are just nature clerics. So, um, I think what it'll end up being is figuring out how druid fits in to uh, if you're trying to make it generic that's probably a direction thing we need to talk about right is we do this because... going to be generic is this going to be more of a generic if it is i'm i'd rather personally rather not i think that right because lawgiver is not generic right it'd be so, better i think if we had it connected to an implied setting even if it's not heavily detailed so uh, lawgiver has flavor Yes. So we should try to have Druid. Maybe no, we don't even call it Druid. Call it something else. Right. Well, that, that's just, again, these are just that's placeholder. Working, working placeholders. And so what about, so that brings up something else. Well, are, are there other classes that, and when I say classes, archetypical classes that have been seen in Dungeons and Dragons that you think we, I'll use the word need, but I know we can say we don't need anything, but that you would like to see developed some other type of well, I think Archetype character. I've right, started on right. Barbarian, but I'm not sure if that's necessary. Well, I think I like the idea of the fighter. Mm -hmm. um, you start out as a fighter, and then you prove yourself, and you can become a knight. Oh, okay. And Kinda then like you could become a holy knight. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. So instead of starting at first level that way, like a paladin you could be a paladin mm -hmm. at first level i think it i think it's i like it better let's say um if you have to prove yourself because all of those uh, like knights you had, did have to prove yourself sure so you couldn't just be some scrubbed you had to go through a lot of training and you had to qualify and you had there was a a big test uh, historically so, and that's where the RC has it right. I think they have a paladin and a knight. And what did they call the third one that was evil? Avenger. Avenger. Or he was not quite evil, but neutral. So I'm, I don't care much about that, but I, I think that could work. I think we talked about it before. That can absolutely work. We got to make sure he doesn't step on the toes of the, of the lawgiver. But I would also definitely be inclined to not give him miracle points. He would be a holy knight kind of. Charlemagne, King Arthur, um, what we might think of the standard paladin, maybe give him a few cool things, maybe his horses, some, I mean, he can just go back to the old summon the horse or, you know, something where he gets a really cool mount um, and maybe his sword gets holy, he can, he's on and they can wield holy weapons or holy artifacts. You know, I think besides, most to have him, uh, probably have him be able to lay on hands. Yeah, at best, a very a lesser version of the lawgiver hmm. where he can do some healing. I don't, I don't want it to be the because right now the, the lawgiver feels a little bit with the spell points. We talk about it later, but it feels like he's he's a little bit of a paladin y dude anyway, but not quite. Uh, I, I actually disagree. If he's okay. with all the spell points he has, he seems more of a caster. Okay. Okay. Well, I said lots to see and play as we gain levels. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you think? You mentioned settings. I was going to bring that up too. So this weekend we're going to play, and I was going to run Temple of Elemental Evil, get us down that path. Um, and I had mentioned the city of Nob in the campaign last time existing. Should we, and this may be too much to ask for, since it's a play test, doesn't matter. Maybe I should, should I do only original stuff? By that, I mean, should I file off the serial numbers, not call it Nob, call it something else? And if I want to use Temple as a template for an adventure, I can, and maybe not run the modules as, as is, but and maybe it doesn't matter since we're play testing we'll eventually add because i'm with you i think we need to have some we need to have a setting along with the, the rule system of mud sword at least i want to that way the characters will feel embedded in the world right i think we can uh instead of trying to have the the, gener the generic thing which D, D already is generic mm -hmm. if we're just making a game we'd like to play i would rather have some implied setting that can give more uh, flavor and meaning to the classes and various things. I didn't step too hard on the toes. Did you like how I gave you the, I didn't step too hard into it. Do you like my little nod to the sisters of the web? 
Oh yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was I good just, stuff. Because I, I want you to. That seems to be something you got a strong idea on. I, I don't want to do too much with it, but mm -hmm. yeah. So that that witch was kind of. Well, the thing is, the, kind of the thing is, a, it's um, a faction that yeah. uh, with the, the sisters do their own thing. Right. Oh yeah. Though though they will say. And who knows if they're saying telling the truth, mm -hmm. or if they're just saying it that mm -hmm. they're all they do is in the service of the um, the, the spider queen that is oh. sleeping. But mm -hmm. you know you can't tell. No, there's no way to know. You can't right. prove it. You can't test it against anything. And as we write fluff into the game, I definitely want to still the approach that 13th age does i don't want to nail everything down in a written document i mean by that i mean i want individual gms to do whatever the hell they want in their little setting world with their game and they can make them maybe they're actually yeah they're up to no good but maybe they're working against the lord of entropy from him breaking free of his prison right and maybe they've made a maybe the spider queen has made a deal with lojas the lawgiver, the God. Mm -hmm. Hey, look, I need you to do some things that my, my guys can't dirty their hands with. I mean, you can do whatever you want, or maybe sure, they're just sure. evil. Maybe she's just evil as can be. Maybe she's a servant of the Lord of Entropy. Who knows? You know, who knows? Maybe she is the Lord of Entropy. The way the way <laughs> I envision the um, these um, factions being written up is mm -hmm. um, fairly short description, but a lot of rumors. Right, rumors are more fun than facts. Yeah. So that the DM can pick that or just to be inspired by it and do their own thing yeah so you so, so i guess to answer the question do you think so should i not should i would you prefer that i don't run like all these all these names are sounding like Greyhawk names because then i can develop a world a little mean while we're that. play testing yeah i don't okay. care okay we're testing it, the it, rules yeah we're testing the rules so i can stick yeah. with yeah all that can change so uh okay what about uh so we're going to be playing this weekend i'm trying to shoot for a i'm going for a six plus hour bi-weekly game i talked to my wife about it i want to do every other saturday starting this saturday um and i know sometimes folks can't make it i know the holidays are coming but i'm going to do my best to run every two weeks so i'm going to need a bigger than just i can't just you know, can't just wait on you and Patrick. I can't just wait on, you know, Greg and Philip. I can't wait for this certain people. I'm just going to say I may end up inviting different folks every time, especially since it's a play test. We can keep going. Um, I don't think the idea of running two groups is really with this. This is a different paradigm than what I originally had trying to run two groups because it was I was just I'm not. First of all, I'm not playing enough. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I work better on a schedule. And I think most people would work better if they knew, oh, this is the, you know, this is the day Randy's playing D&D. &D. Can I make it this week? And I may just say until my table's full, I'm just, and this is hard for me to do, but I want to make it an open table because it's a play test and just tell people, hey, when certain groups played before this happened, so I'm starting from here and this is where we're going. That's fine. I think that'll be okay. Yeah, you know, it could be fun. Yeah. yeah. So then you may say, because like I know if Jeff plays this weekend, he doesn't listen to our podcast. He won't know that there was even a witch inside that tower. You right. guys discovered that. They did not. They never encountered the spider or cat. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to go back and finish that. Right. So um, I'm spilling the beans here. I'm just going to pick up and say, okay, um, I'm going to give you guys an option. Uh, actually, I don't know. I want to play test. I, I want to. I may get a little railroaded. I may just say, yeah, you're going to go to Nob and you're going to investigate the dryad thing. That's I was gonna cool. Do I was going to do the time thing, but I think I'll wait. Either, just... either way. Either way is a little railroady, but who cares? Yeah. We're play testing the rules. We're not really right. doing anything else. Right. So, so however you probably, want to, basically, yeah. uh, however much role play and town time and all that other stuff you want to do is cool, but uh, we're play testing rules. So we need to get to the point where the rules are tested. And yes you can't and so spend a whole lot of time doing other stuff and i think i'll also so i don't want to not role play but i don't want to be if someone goes that didn't happen last time we played so, right but when i put but when i played last time the, these guys did this and i like this idea better hmm. so I'm, I'm running with this you know they found the spider cat and they knew it had to do with the sisters of the web so i'm exploring that avenue 
or I'm not, whatever. I'm do. Right, right, right. So, yeah. Okay. I was just wanted to get that. You said you had some stuff you wanted to chat yeah. about too. Combat. So I think that we should incorporate into combat, and this will be a way to, um, um, I think mm -hmm. it'll be a way to help control powerful spellcasters and perhaps yeah. missile uh, uh, archer types um, with casters. Uh, if they're just able to get their spells off all the time mm -hmm. without any real danger that they're going to get interrupted, mm -hmm. which is the way it currently seems, mm -hmm. um, then they're going to seem powerful. So yes. uh, the idea is you declare, like in the old days, mm -hmm. you declare, then you roll, then you resolve. Right. And you start out, and it's not like phased combat where we do spells first and then missiles next. Sure. And then right. I don't I think that's kind of silly. It's it's uh it's war game stuff that we don't really need. Right. Um, but you do because combat rounds are abstract it's bits of time. Yeah. You, when you have your character, your figures on the table, it's not like you're static, like your character figure is on the table. You're right. moving around and doing different things and dodging and weaving, um, uh, pairing blows, um, and all kinds of stuff happens. Right. As uh, Max Liao in Legion of Myth puts it, it's a scrum, it's not yes. a dance. No. So you, you declare. So you're going to have some casters will say, I'm going to start casting sleep or whatever. And then, then you roll. So you may not know which roll way for initiative. you roll for initiative. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you find out whether you go first or not. You do that after you declare. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. So I do have a spell disruption mechanic, though it's not really disruption. Um, I call, What I have written down is it's an attack of opportunity is cast if you cast a spell next to a foe as a free attack. But your situation would allow for a disruption attempt if you get to go before the caster. And I, I currently have it set up that if you're hit while casting, you must make an unmodified saving throw based on your level, unmodified. So right. you just roll it. And if you make it, then you're fine. You can finish your casting. If you don't, the spell disrupted. But I'm leaning toward, because of limitation, you tell me this is good or not, that disruption just means you couldn't finish your spell. It is not gone from your memory. You just can't do it that round. And you essentially lose your turn. You got screwed. You took damage I, and your spell got screwed. So you can try it again next round, but they can, But if you don't get initiative, they might pop you again. You know, yeah. well, what and do you think of that? I think that's fine. Yeah. It's generous. Just, it's generous. It is generous, but honestly, I, maybe it's because of my experience in in third edition that I feel like I don't really shouldn't feel that way because wizards are so powerful. Um, maybe I should, you know, we'll see. Maybe I'll, it'll eventually I'll figure out. You know what? Wizards need to lose their spells when they get disrupted, and that'll make wizards a little more leery of just dropping the fireball right at the beginning. And when we, hopefully, when we uh, write this up, we might have options listed, right? Mm -hmm. The base game, it might be that you save and you may not lose your, your spell, but in a more cutthroat game or or whatever, we might say, optionally, the DM may say you lose your spell or, or the opposite may happen. The base game may be lose your spell, but the option might be for more soft-headed DMs to say... Um, soft-headed. <laughs> might... Uh, <laughs> might uh, pass. Soft-hearted, maybe, might be better. <laughs> Is that a folks pass? <laughs> yeah. Um, it might, uh, the base game, you might lose it, and the option might be to just say you um, lose your turn. Yeah, uh, honestly, I think. And But archers, it's the same for archers, right? So if you're if you're back being an archer or some other sort of character that's a support character, and then you're, you're beginning your support activity, whatever mm -hmm. that might be. Right. You have to you declare that, just like mm -hmm. any, if you're in the in the front lines, you're saying what you declare. I'm I'm going to attack or whatever. Right. Everybody's got their declared declared action, and then uh, that means I think you might uh, encourage more cohesiveness in party 
in party tactics so that people look to protect the casters, look to protect the archers instead of everybody just going off and doing their own thing individually. So I think story-wise then, it won't be unfair. People would cry foul if, you know, my bad guys get initiative and they're not morons. I mean, they're not geniuses. I mean, they're, they understand casters are bad news. If you begin casting a spell, I get to go first. Shoot that damn caster. Right. Or shoot that archer. I mean, those guys are dangerous. Oh, yeah. You know? And so then we can have to talk about what if a fighter goes, I'm giving my turn up and I'm protecting the wizard. We could say, okay, because that's a big give. That's a big give up. And you say, that's what I'm doing. I'm declaring my action to protect him. And so you lose initiative. The bad guys go. The fighter's like, hey, I'm standing with my big ass shield up. Maybe the wizard gets the fighter's armor class. Or something. Or something. Some kind the, of bonus. The fighter might be able to interpose or yeah. something like the that. The shield bonus can be added to the wizard's armor class. I mean, maybe something. We can figure that out. And you know, it depends on how tactical we want to make it. And do we want in that environment another idea is, is there a reason to have individual initiative then? Yeah, that would be, that would be initiative. That would be, okay, I can see the, I can see arguments either way. I prefer individual. Right, but couldn't group initiative also encourage cohesiveness? Let me cast my spell first to soften them up or the fighter say, hey, let me rush up there and smack their wizard guy before you do anything. But I mean, right, so, I don't know. It may not so be, I don't know. You could either do um, group initiative in which that's easier, or you can have individual initiative, but have built in delaying or, yes. or readying so right. that you can do stuff like that too. Yeah. And like currently our initiative system is roll D20, add your decks, and there is no other modifiers. Right, right. And which I like that simplicity. I don't want to get too crazy with improved initiative and all kinds of weird feats and bonuses and stuff. Right. Though we might do something with an ability for a rogue at higher level to go quick if they wish to. Mm. Okay, cool. Also, um, it's something more of a discussion than anything else. Um, sure. So, was thinking about uh, save or die spells and that sleep spell. Mm -hmm. where it affects so many figures so many um enemies on the battlefield yep and how uh, i've read some early some articles and uh, the older rules and saving was a thing for the heroes on the battlefield okay whereas the troops didn't usually get a saving throw We're talking chain mail, I believe. J mail and maybe oh, old okay, DMD. okay, yeah, that's really early, yeah. And uh, so maybe that's why the sleep spell affects so many targets and uh, has no saving throw because the assumption is uh, you're attacking big a uh, unit type right. thing instead of individual, you know, like character characters on the battlefield. Sure. So, do we want to change that? So currently, we're using um beck me versions of spells and a right. lot of them are save or die or save or suck like mm -hmm. a lot of people have complained about over the years or do we want to keep that flavor of um making the spell letting the spell be powerful mm -hmm. but you know if the and you use this on us you turn the tables and had the the witch mm -hmm. cast sleep on the party Yep. And if it hadn't been for how we had my stand-in character yeah. got, got free, <laughs> uh -huh. the party would have died. Yes. Because he was able to run in there and kick them all awake. Mm -hmm. Because he he stayed, he had hung back and wasn't in the fight. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So um yeah. do, how how much do we want <laughs> to have? Yep. that kind of stuff that can be to a tpk or can be um like the one encounter was i think yeah uh, you kill all those goblins orcs. Just, yeah orcs so you just shut them down boom yeah out. i mean i don't know um it's a little jarring having not played it for a while but mm -hmm. right now it is. i, I kind of want to stick with it for a little bit longer 
But I mean, I think that's that's something we need to revisit. Uh, save or suck spells. Because I, I really, I never liked that argument that people made. That was mostly, I most, I think it was probably going on in first or second edition too. I don't remember it. But I remember in third edition, it seemed like it was um, a lot of crybabies. Well, here's the thing too, with cyclical um, initiative, where you mm -hmm. roll once and you just stick with it. <clears throat> and when that spell cat enemy spellcaster comes up, you really you, there's nothing you can do. True. But he if gets you to have, go first, he's going first. Right. In the next the next round, he's going first again. Right. And then he's going again. So, um, but well, if you like, have it, it cuts both ways. Sure. So it does. You always get to go first. It sucks because you're fireball, sleep, El Sacero. You know, <laughs> so I get my spells off. And unless they get to you. I mean. Let's say the first round you get an initiative, and the second round their commander goes, somebody kill that wizard, and then three or four guys come charging, and your fighters take two of them. But next thing you know, you got a orc wielding a spike chain trying to take your head off. So I think and, this is going to encourage larger, larger encounters, mm -hmm. because if if you keep the encounter numbers small, you'll shut them down. Wizards will shut them down. Um, likely seems like it. But that also means small groups of four or five people. There's a reason for having multiple characters, having six, seven, eight player characters, because when sleep comes up, you may still have three standing. Right, right. <laughs> so there's a good argument for more characters. But to me, the to me, the game itself is a different question. When you're playing on the when you're playing, I get you can have eight people at the table, but when we like to use minis and set up fights, it seems okay, we're outside the door, you know, we're coming through roll initiative you didn't get it so i don't know maybe we gotta think about it maybe maybe this is going to bring us back to some tactics maybe it's going to be a fun thing yeah. maybe we're going to think now that we're adults playing the old game because we played as kids for a long time maybe we'll see different things that'll be i have a feeling they might become more charming because we'll be more like oh crap i gotta think a little more carefully now well that's why that's why my character died yeah because i wasn't being careful mm-hmm I was like, well, I want to against the spider. Right against the spider. I wanted my character to do something instead of nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, he should have just done nothing. <laughs> because he should have moved, he should have moved as far as he can get from that spider and hide. Right. That's what he should have done. Right. But yeah, you're right. I didn't think about it at the time, but that's we got that. And you know what? That's another that's reason cool. why I'm, I didn't I wasn't upset because I, I'm the one who blew it. Right, right, right. You you said that. And yeah. and there's but there's also the reason of that's a dynamic that changed drastically when third edition came around. Because mm -hmm. we had, you know, we had people, especially in three five. I remember our buddy Greg T built a fighter or a wizard that could jump right in the middle of melee. Right. That's how he right. rolled. He was nothing but a wizard, like an abjurer. He was crazy good. So yeah, that's that's interesting. So we got to think about that. The saver suck in particular sleep. That's a good. That's a good point, Joe. And I, I kind of, I feel like we haven't seen enough, but I know it can look like. You can see a couple of actions. You go, whoa, this could be devastating. And that's true. It could be. And we may find, because at some point, if it is devastating, I don't want, no one will say this about the players, but the DM can become, oh, you're a mean DM because you gave the bad wizard, first level wizard, who's your enemy, the sleep spell. And I go, but wouldn't your character take the sleep spell? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah, we, we may have to revisit this. So yeah. And if, if you, if you're not rolling up, your spells randomly if you get to select yep sleep if you, you don't choose sleep mm -hmm. why don't you choose sleep well and even but even like as a dm if i'm building a wizard who's the head of these orcs or whatever he's an evil guy he's, i mean did he really just does he really just have read magic and read languages comprehend languages really i mean because i rolled randomly that's what he gets how are the orcs impressed by this moron? Right. I will read. I will speak your language. And understand it. Whatever. Lop. I right. mean, the wizard's got to have some firepower, so the orcs are like, "Whoa, he's the boss." I mean, you may also want to have comprehend languages because sure. it helps a lot. Well, there's but nothing not wrong just, with it. But you don't no. just want to have the helpful spells, the helpful non-combat spells. You want to have at least the, one. I don't know how the evil wizard doesn't. 
he's got to do something to impress them. Right. They're not going to let him lead them or even the bandits. Why are bandits going to listen to a wizard who they could just go with their dagger and kill him? Got to be something. Got to be something. Yeah. And it's going to suck for the players when he uses that something on them. Yeah. So we got to decide how sucky you want the experience to be. Especially and- if it's Magic Jar. <laughs> Joe's favorite. <laughs> so when we're playing, I'm going to bring some save or suck into the game from the bad guys. And we may find this is not terribly fun and we don't like it. Or we may find, and I hope you'll do this and I think you will bring up the idea. Well, maybe we need to be more tactical with this being on the table. And we know it is because I can do it. And so can you, Patrick, with your wizard, if he brings one. And like, we need to realize this crap can happen. So when you have a when you know your enemy is a wizard, you'll be like, whoa. Concentrate yeah. everything on that dude. Yeah, find some way to get to him, which we used to do that a lot. Yeah. And and I may find that's great. I may find that's not fun. Because then I can say, well, dude, I get that you love that, but you kill my wizard all the time. I never get to cast any spells ever. And it's being a little babyish, but like it could also be not fun. Well, you need to be tactical. Roll them in invisible. Absolutely. And I'm not afraid to do that. Right. Roll him in backwards with being a ogre, make him an ogre mage. Let him teleport behind, fly invisible, and kill your wizard. Behind my character and lop his head off with a right. Naginata or Just whatever he's to got. Fight that, way. that tends to work out pretty well. Okay. Sounds good, man. So, <laughs> in saying this, I don't want us to, and it, it, maybe it was initially, but I don't want to create a clone of the old school game and just slap another name on it. Agreed. What I want is the feel. Yeah of danger for your for the pcs so mm-hmm. that you feel that you've accomplished things even if you've had to go through two or three different characters to finally make it to second third level where you have more hit points and you can survive the rest of the encounters of yes. that, that night so um instead of it being kind of a cakewalk is I, I looked at a um an article that Josh sent us. And I think Josh sent us the what's up doc one. So and the phylactery one, or maybe Josh, I think you might've sent them both. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Josh, for the articles. Yeah. Um, So yeah. um, There was another article he sent from a fellow who said that there's some issue with experience points with fifth edition. And, you know, I was like, it's fifth edition. I don't care, but (laughs) I, I looked at it and um, essentially he was like, well, there's this dip. Yep. Did you read it? Right. Not half of it. I've heard it before. There's a 10th to 14th level dip. I think it was 10 to 14th level. No, there. his was earlier. Oh, it's so like low six level. Level. So no, earlier. So, oh, really? So yeah. it, between third and eighth level, there's oh. this. Uh, it takes longer to get through those levels than the higher levels. <laughs> okay, higher level monsters are worth more experience points. It was the, something it, right. The mathematics doesn't work out quite right, and so a lot of campaigns peter out eighth, ninth level because you played so long just to get there. Right. Yeah. So, but his solution was lower enough, lower the experience points that you need to get to those levels. Hmm. And I'm like, three hundred experience points to get to second level. Ah. Uh, that's Ugh. pretty. I don't know. That's so kind of mealy. The game already is very heavily favored to the characters. Yeah. And you're going to make it easier to get to the through those low levels. Low and level. Even the, go ahead. Low level should take some time so you yeah. can get to know your character as because a, you suck. And and yeah. you suck. You shouldn't you get suck. better that fast. No, no. Um, so it should take a time for you to garner the appropriate amount of experience to advance. Yeah. And if you use training, it should take some time, though. If you're not gaining much, it probably shouldn't take that much time to train. Yeah. Yeah, Heathen Dog today on uh, Legion made a comment. He had a little bit of a, a thesis, he called it, on leveling. And he, I think he concluded there should be a year between levels. That seems like a year to train. That seemed a little much. But having said that, I get where he's coming from because he made the comment. What if you're, you know, in third, in a lot of these games, even third edition, we used to talk about this. I'm 25 years old and I'm an arc mage. I'm 20th level. Right. I mean, right. there's no time passage. I think time can passage outside of that. Time can pass outside of training. That's sounding a lot like, I don't want to go too far down the road because that sounds a lot like a uh, podcast. 
Right. Uh, and there's some other things. Add time. this, add this, and not just training, mm -hmm. but in some classes, a lot of them, uh, mm -hmm. and I was looking at um, um, Dragonlance, the, was, uh, the Wizards of Towers of High Sorcery. Yeah. Right. At their, they had pinnacles where, like, one of them, there's only one 18th level wizard. Okay. Of this yep. one particular tower. And some of them are lower. Like, there's only one of 15th or higher level. There's only one oh. of, yeah. So having things like that built into perhaps the game could um, serve to, you know, make it more flavorful. Maybe not only one 18th level, but maybe. Yeah. You got to like seek out that dude and say, I'm the new guy. I don't know what you want to do. I'm, we can duke it out or you can just step down. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like the old Druids. Eighth level, you had to fight for every rank. <laughs> right. Was it, it started eighth? I think it was eighth or ninth. It was pretty oh, early. Boy. Yeah. Well, some people would say end of game. Yeah. I want old school feel, but yeah. not necessarily old school, all of the old school rules because some of them I don't like. So, yeah, we're going to have to, I think we need to sit and discuss kind of a, I was looking up how to make your own TTRPG online, which is dangerous, but they did make one, one comment. You need to have a very specific goal in mind. And right now, I'm not sure we do. And I feel myself holding myself when I want to create new abilities or things for characters, I'll pull myself back. because That's not how old school works. And then I'm thinking, and you made it, I'm glad you said that. I want us to create something as new as it can be, it's going to be a D&D &D variant, but I want it to be our own thing. And so I don't want to create new crap to create new crap, but I want to feel comfortable if I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't mind having talents for characters. Things That's, like that is something that I uh, was thinking of recently too. Yeah. And, uh, talents as a way not to have mm -hmm. some general way to customize your character, but more customizing within the class correct so um so the talents like uh talents would lead to um different sorts of fighters or different sorts of wizards but yeah. not like having a bunch of general general ones either I, that's well, where like, class background race that's how yeah you differentiate and then uh, within the class you have ways to differentiate but not outside of that, I don't think. Right, and, and, and we may not want to have too many of them so it becomes overwhelming like feats. No, no, but no. Just enough to give you a little flavor. I mean, even currently the fighter has pretty generic abilities like the, the smash and the parry and the things like that, the block, whatever it is that they got that we borrowed from the RC. And those are nice places to jump off from. And we, we might be able to streamline that better too. But you and I need to sit down. I think we ought to sit down and try to, if we could, hammer out. This sounds so academically stupid as possible in business because we do it in academia all the time and also in business a mission statement <laughs> if you will for this game so we know so we can have some parameters from which to work it's a good idea and maybe you should take a class and i should take a class and we'll within those parameters build them out to say 10 levels i don't want to go 20 yet and just look at them and say hey this is kind of how we want to roll you know, and you take the wizard and I'll take a fighter or I'll take a clear the lawgiver or whatever. But the lawgiver is getting up. He's pretty well developed, you know, not not fully, but he's got stuff. He's got stuff to get as if he just gets it. So maybe I want to do some talent type things. Right. All right. Sounds good. All right. Okay. So um, anything more to add at all? No, I need to clean the mud off. I think we played enough in the mud. All right. So. Um, what I'm going to do is contest time, right? Oh, yes, contest time. Hold on. Okay. Um, you got something else in mind? I'm going to add it to the show notes. Maximum X crawl. Contest of champions. Those listening on the PDF side, I was just showing off the cool new the three choices the winner is going to get tonight to pick from and let us know. So, Battles of the Abyss Inferno, which is a 
battle game where you play demon lords and stuff. Pretty cool. Played years ago. Uh, the box is not perfect. It's got a bit of a tear, but hey, it's free. Don't complain. Uh, D&D 5th edition, Out of the Abyss, Rage of Demons, their adventure path, hardback, not really used. And then Maximum x -Crawl, Core Rule Books. I had an extra one, so thought I would put it up. And those are looking on the U of Tubes. Really pretty cover on the inside. I don't know if it's colorful all the way through. I think it's black and white inside, but they got really nice inside cover art. All right, so I've updated the show notes. Okay. So uh, I should have had it on there. I wasn't thinking. Yeah. We have 18 currently um, eligible because they have, I hope, they have. Um, subscribed on youtube i have no way of knowing that youtube doesn't tell me who our subscribers are yes. unless they let us know i do okay. there um yeah, you, you there's a setting a privacy setting where you can say i don't want you to know what i've subscribed to so. okay so if they're not listening they're just going to miss out huh how much time are we going to give them like if i roll one of the youtubers that don't listen regularly well the um the 18 that have given us their email Mm. that's where we're drawing this from right that's the uh, two-parter you sub, sub, subscribe on youtube give us your email and you don't have to be watching us because you can't because we're not live no. so um <laughs> we then email you we announce it on the podcast and on the youtube so if you're if you listen to us subsequently tomorrow when we post this tomorrow night yes um then you can find out that way Otherwise, you will know by email because we have your email. We, we know do. where you mail and your we're not emails. afraid. To, we're not afraid to use it. No. So we, we have 18. Okay, shall I roll? You shall roll. All right, baby. You got the, you keep track. I'm rolling the dice. Survey says number seven. Number seven. Lucky number seven. Lucky number eleven. Oh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Starting from the top, number seven. Mm -hmm. Our website is moving very slow. Okay. Come on. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The um, <clears throat> email. email is Zach. R I S O N George at gmail.com. I do not okay. know who this person is by their email. I know okay. some of them by their email, but this one, I don't know. Okay. So Zachary's on George. Is it Z A C K? Z A C K R I S O N George, George at, at gmail.com. Gmail okay. Congratulations, Zach. You've won. You're going to need to pick between one of these. Three sweet prizes, dude. Pathfinder, Maximum X Crawl, D and D Adventure, Out of the Abyss, Fifth Edition, Fifth Edition. Yep, old school, and or new school, and then a really old ninety seven, ninety eight battle game with. Uh, I think everything is complete in here. I even got it all bagged and stuff. I did play it a while. I left you a little magazine in there too. So if you're has to do with this game, Inferno, Battles of the Abyss. So. Whatever you want, let me know and those three things, and I'll try to get it mailed out ASAP. Congratulations, Zach. What we will do is uh, email Zach. Yep. Hopefully, we can call you Zach because that's the first four letters of your email. We'll email, get some um, uh, details on how to send this to you, and yep. go from there. I'll get it out. I got a box waiting, dude. All right. Cool. Sweet. We had three winners, so... All right. So we are from here. I believe we have decided that we will go to 250 will be the next level of contest. Yeah. 250 subscribers on YouTube. On YouTube. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do a contest of champions three. That'll give me a little bit of time. Joe's trying to crack the whip, make me do it now, but I can't be sure until I'm probably going to keep whatever doesn't go here on the list and just add one more new one. I'll okay. see if I can pick something, something a little older school or different. So uh, non-Pathfinder, 
maybe Max will be intrigued to want to win and over it. Legion. What we could do is um, put up, I can maybe put up a survey or we can just ask you guys out there, let us know, submit uh, an email or voicemail or whatever, what kind uh -huh. of things you would like to see us give away. You don't know yeah. what uh, we have or, or anything and we don't get enough we don't get really income from this. It's uh, no, it's just for fun. But I have a bunch of crap I shouldn't have that I need to get rid of. I don't yeah. use. So a handful of things, maybe 10, 12 items, more than that, probably 30 items I have that I should give away. So I'm willing to do contests as long as we get subscribers. Yes. So we're going to ratchet up to 250, you said. So they're going to have to work yeah. hard. People got to start loving our YouTube with this. I, I think it took only took, when was the 50? How long ago was that? Let's it wasn't see. too long ago when we started so. talking to the Legion guys. They we started getting a lot, and you being on there, and I'm going to try to be on there this Friday. So Friday is the chilling, their chilling show. Yes, Friday okay. chill. What time do they usually start? Eight o'clock. No, it's actually later. Um, oh. There is another live stream that uh, Matt, uh, that we wait until it's over with. Okay. Um, can't remember the name of it okay but we there's another one we we wait uh, until the end of that or, or max right. max over at uh, legion, legion of myth waits and then he starts it's usually it doesn't start until like 10 30 okay i'll try to make a note and try to get a i'm going to get in on that early so i can join you on that if you're if you happen to be on right i'm trying to find out i'm trying to figure out how long it took us to go from around 50 to uh to 100 the uh, 100 we are at now that seem are we at 100 now we are at 100 so that was from when oh, hockey puck won go. so yeah that's uh that was probably yeah probably a couple weeks months I can look i can what i can do and which is what i am doing which is thrilling mm -hmm. podcasting Mm -hmm. thrilling i know everybody is thrilled i'm going to go to facebook and look at my um biggest geekest uh facebook page and scroll through the posts and <clears throat> and find out which one of these if i put it in there. it's possible that i posted it's entirely possible that I made a post about our, our, um, well, <laughs> our uh, giveaway or post about our podcast without, yeah. um, <laughs> saying anything about the giveaway in it. So it might be fruitless to look. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah. Well, yeah, probably this is not terribly exciting podcast. No, it's not. And I'm not seeing it. So <laughs> okay, however long you... it took, I'm thinking it's uh, a month or less. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I, I think, like I said, the Legion guys really helped us, their exposure there. I think they pushed us pretty, their watchers, you know, we got some people from them. So thanks to them again. Oh, okay. Right. So uh, um, if we have nothing else yeah. to say. Yeah. Congratulations, Zach. We'll be getting yes. in touch with you. Yep. All right. Moving along. If you would like to support our show, please visit the many places you can find us on the interwebs. Yes. Our website is biggestgeekestpodcast.com. We're on Twitter at Biggest Geekest, Facebook, MeWe, Odyssey, YouTube. You can look us up in any of those uh, places by just put it, typing in the search engine Biggest Geekest. Yes. And our email is the geeks at biggestgeekestpodcast.com. Uh, share this show with your friends, please, and let us know if there's any other way. Uh, that you listen or watch that we could support better please like uh, please subscribe like and share and rate us in all the places that you find us yeah that'll help yep and there's a, a a few things that we'd like that we will put in our um show notes where you can uh look at other podcasts or youtube channels and that kind of stuff sweet sweet Anything else? Any alibis? Nope. <clears throat> uh, all right. So with that, I am Joe. And I'm Randy.
And remember, if you can't be big like us, then be geeks like us.